Madison got up early the next morning, still feeling cramps in her abdomen. However, they weren't nearly as bad as on the day of the accident in the mall, and Dr. Garcia also had said that it wasn't serious. Mostly, she had suffered a big shock. However, Olivia still had some thoughts on the matter, and she came over early that morning. Ian had taken a break for the day, and he chatted with his father somewhere else in the house, while Olivia gave Madison a hand in the kitchen. As they were slicing up onions, she told her, You should be more careful next time. You're lucky that you weren't pregnant. But what if you had been? Do you realize how serious that would have been? Madison lowered her head. She washed the vegetables and didn't speak. How could I not know how dangerous that could have been, she thought. After all, Kelsey was still in the hospital. After her crash landing, Kelsey had still been able to carry on and act out her scene. She had actually been impressed by her. But Madison knew the price she had paid. The child was gone. And her relationship with Luke might take a hit. I wonder how the future is going to pan out for Kelsey. She's still so young, Madison thought. Are you Ian planning to have a baby? Olivia asked. You've already made a name for yourself in the city. But even with our family and Ian protecting you, you should still understand that now is not the time to be working. It was true. At just 23 years of age, she was already known as Ian Weston's wife. If she continued to work at Green, she would surely cause herself a lot of trouble. She didn't even dare imagine what could happen. The people around her would try to leech off of her just because of her newfound wealth and position. But to have a baby... Is that what Diana and Olivia really wanted? She wondered. Madison kept her head down and stayed silent as Olivia continued. Diana will turn 80 in September. I think a grandchild would be the most wonderful gift that you could give her and the family. She didn't say any more than that. It was already enough. If Madison was smart, she would understand that this was her chance to please Diana. And with the Westons protecting the child... Her life would become even smoother. Olivia's words occupied her mind completely, and she couldn't think of anything else. She still hadn't had the chance to tell Ian about Diana's call the previous night. This kind of pressure is scaring me, she thought. The lunch they had made was delicious. Olivia wasn't just a rich person who didn't know how to do anything practical, and she wasn't at all bad at cooking. The family ate together, and during the meal... Ian noticed that Madison wasn't completely present. However, he didn't want to ask her about it in front of his parents. Back at the apartment, Madison sat down on a rocking chair on the balcony, hugging a big teddy bear. Her eyes were wide, and she seemed to be deep in thought. She didn't even notice Ian as he walked over to her. Is it time to have a child? She wondered. He stood beside her quietly, looking down at her. His eyes traced her fair skin, Curled eyelashes and pink lips, her beauty on full display before him. What are you thinking about? he asked in a low voice. She raised her head and looked deeply into his eyes. She hugged the bear even closer. Her face turned pale, and he could see that she was nervous. However, he couldn't tell what she was thinking about. He frowned, and her phone rang just as he was preparing himself to speak. He signaled for her to take the call and walked away to get some water. As he was walking back, he heard her say, I'm scared, Zach. Zach, he thought, his expression turning cold. He had noticed that his wife often relied more on her brother than on him. She was telling Zach about her current worries before she had told him. This bothered Ian. He couldn't tell if Zach had said anything, and he decided to interrupt their conversation by telling her, We're having dinner with some people from work this evening. Don't forget to set an alarm for your afternoon nap. Her body stiffened at the sudden sound of his voice. She was slightly panicked as she nodded, and she told Zach that she couldn't meet him. Ian had told her about the dinner with his colleagues from the hospital a long time ago. It was meant to be a sort of celebration of their wedding, as if he hadn't told them about it before. This evening was supposed to make up for it. She hung up and went back to hugging the teddy bear, and gently rocking back and forth. There was a frown on her face, and Ian narrowed his eyes at her. He didn't say anything. What is she afraid of? He wondered. At half past five that evening, 
Ian and Madison arrived at the Griffin. He was wearing a simple, long-sleeved t-shirt and casual pants, and he held onto her hand as they walked inside. He attracted the attention of many people. Mr. Williams came forward to greet them with a smile, and the news of Ian Weston taking his wife for dinner there spread quickly among the tables. They were directed to the room where their dinner was being held, and when they came in, they could see that several of the Mercy Hospital doctors had already arrived. They were slightly reserved at first, but when they saw that Ian was just the same as he'd always been, they gradually relaxed. Madison was already familiar with several of the people inside the room. There was Linda Lloyd, Ron Tanner, Dr. Faltas, and Dr. Lopez. There were also some others that she hadn't met yet. All she knew about them was that they were close colleagues of Ian's. You devil, you hid all of this from us for so long, Ron said boldly. The others cheered, but none of them said anything else. They were still disconcerted by Ian's identity. This was actually the reason why he had chosen to hide it from them in the first place. Ron continued, We never would have guessed that you're one of the Watkins. I think an apology is in order. Ian and Ron were quite familiar with each other. After all, Ron had been following him around since he had become an intern and was basically his disciple. He was comfortable enough with their relationship to stir up the atmosphere, clearing the air a bit. They were all happy to mess with Ian a little after that. Ian smiled, and Madison felt her mind go blank as she looked into his eyes. Over the rim of her wine glass, she gazed at his Adam's apple. She tilted her head and licked her lips subconsciously. The female doctors who knew Ian at the hospital were all present. When Dr. Faltas had seen him walking in with Madison, she had turned green with envy. She had never expected someone like Madison to come along and snatch Ian away from her. Not after she had been aiming at him for so long. And to top it off, she had now found out that he was the mysterious Ian Weston, known all over the city. She wasn't willing to accept this, and she wasn't alone in her thoughts. Even Dr. Lopez felt a similar way. Miss Greenwald, did you know who Ian was when you married him? Dr. Faltas asked Madison. She had addressed her with her maiden name on purpose, and she had obviously done so with bad intentions. Linda watched from the side, and the bite of appetizer she was preparing to eat paused on the way to her mouth. You must have... Why on earth would you marry a mere doctor? She added. Her eyes were burning with emotion as she looked at Madison. It was as if she was trying to burn a hole right through her. Madison looked at her for a moment and then retaliated. Are you feeling well? You seem to have forgotten the purposes of today's gathering. Perhaps you should get yourself checked up. Fortunately, there are quite a few doctors here. She said this very casually without shifting her gaze. Dr. Faltas was treating her without respect, so she decided to take the same approach with her. There was no Miss Greenwell there, only Mrs. Weston. She might not have taken such offense had someone else addressed her using that name. However, she knew very well that Vivian Faltas was after her husband, and she wanted to remind her that Ian was a married man. The smile on Dr. Faltas' face stiffened, and she tried to remember what the purpose of the gathering actually was. She had been so preoccupied with the thought of seeing Ian that she had completely forgotten that the evening was supposed to be a celebration of his recent wedding. Despite Madison's snapback, she refused to call her Mrs. Weston. However, Madison didn't care. Even if Dr. Falta didn't admit it to herself, Madison was still Ian's wife. She couldn't change that by simply wishing it away. The doctor could continue lying to herself for the rest of her life if she wanted. Quickly... Linda came up to them to try and settle the situation, and it didn't take long for the atmosphere to warm up again. However, when Madison turned around, she saw that Dr. Lopez had mysteriously disappeared. She looked around the room for her, and finally found her drinking along with a group of men. The doctor raised her glass and they toasted. Madison raised her eyebrows at the sight but didn't comment on it. Her eyes fell on Ian, who was now standing at the end of the table. He had been drinking one glass after another, and she couldn't help but frown. He had already had so much wine, and dinner hadn't even started. She was worried that he would be drunk when they went home that evening. She had never seen him drunk before. She went over to Mr. Williams and asked him to start serving dinner. 
She didn't want Ian to be sick. Right then, there came a voice from the door, and she turned around to see Shane standing in the doorway. Madison, he asked, his eyes full of joy. Startled, Ian swung around, accidentally bumping into Dr. Lopez. She stumbled and fell towards Shane, who quickly caught her in his arms. Ian's eyes narrowed at the man. Then he turned around to look at Madison. Madison was also surprised. Shane was really beginning to haunt her. Shane had come to the Griffin that evening to meet up with some colleagues. However, they had all canceled at the last minute, and he was left there alone. Just as he had been about to head back, he noticed Madison. He greeted her and saw Ian burst his lips. Shane, Madison said, happy to see him. Without thinking, she asked, Have you eaten anything? Come join us. He smiled warmly, catching the attention of the women in the room. They wondered why a man as fine as him would be coming in to see Madison. Ian was noble and elegant. Zach was majestic and authoritative. And Jason was bright and cheerful. Now this man had appeared, as fresh as a spring breeze. It seems that every desirable man was connected to Madison somehow. Ian walked over to them, wrapped his arm around Madison's waist and said, Perfect. Come meet with us. Shane's smile only deepened at his words, and he nodded. The ladies were quite excited at the prospect of him joining them for dinner. They had missed out on their chance with Ian, but perhaps they could succeed with Shane. Once he had been introduced to everyone, Mr. Williams began bringing them platters of delicacies. The wine had put them all in a good mood, and they were happy to dig in. As they toasted, one of the doctors said, Well, Ian, you kept this from us for so long. And if it weren't for the Quinn and Gold engagement, who knows when we would have found out. Your punishment for deceiving us all will be to drink yourself stupid with us today. The others grunted in agreement. Madison joined in and also had some wine. Soon, Ian's face began to turn a rosy shade of pink, yet he still raised another glass with a smile on his face. Suddenly, his hand clasped Madison's under the table. A warm feeling flowed through his body all the way into his heart, and his smile became even more charming. He turned to her in front of everyone and whispered into her ear, I think I'm a little drunk. I hope you don't mind. Her face blushed hotly as she felt his warm lips brush against the edge of her ear. He was so close to her that she shivered. She remembered the only time they had had any sort of intimate contact was when he had kissed her at Kelsey's party. Her blush deepened and she kept her gaze low unable to meet anyone's eyes. Shane sat opposite her, and his eyes narrowed as he looked at the interaction between them. However, the intensity of the smile didn't decrease. He clinked his glass with hers over the table. It was full of the same heavy wine that Ian had been drinking all evening. Let's have a drink together, he said. Madison came back to her senses and looked at him. She then turned to Ian and whispered, Maybe you should slow down with the wine? Those around her that heard those words smiled. Everyone at the table was laughing and joking. They no longer seemed affected by the discovery of Ian's social status. Regardless of whether this was due to the influence of alcohol or something else, it was exactly the result that Ian had wanted. He had always felt that being a part of the Weston family was a hindrance. However, he had also never thought that it was a big deal. Shane, are you staying in town for a while longer? Madison asked softly. She seemed to be running into him quite often. Suddenly, the thought of Cassandra flashed across her mind. She didn't know how long exactly Cassandra had been waiting around for Shane, but she knew that it must have been for a long time. She only hoped that he would one day be able to see Cassandra as she saw him. Shane nodded and replied, There are some cases I need to work on here. I'm expecting it to take a long time. Madison nodded and said that they would like to invite him out for dinner sometime. As soon as she finished speaking, Ian reminded her to eat, taking her focus away from Shane and drowning out his answer. As Madison dug in, the two men locked eyes over the table for a second. There were unspoken words between them. However, they were clear about how they stood with each other. Dr. Fultus, are you all right? A caring voice asked and everyone turned around to look at her. 
Her face was flushed, and she seemed to have had too much to drink. You've had quite a lot to drink, haven't you? One of the doctors had asked the question. Everyone at the hospital knew that she liked Ian, and now that he had suddenly gotten married, it was understandable that she would feel uncomfortable. It didn't seem like a good idea for her to get drunk, as these kinds of situations often led to social disasters. Madison lowered her head and continued eating, showing no concern for the situation. Shane saw what was happening and laughed a little. Jokingly, he said to Dr. Falter, It seems that you can't hold your liquor. It would have been better if he hadn't said anything, as his words caused her to start making a fuss. How would you know? I haven't done anything silly, she said, slurring her words. She looked at her dinner companions with misty eyes, and then fixed her gaze on Ian. You guys give me a chance. There's something I'd like to say. Madison's hand stopped midair, and the entire table quieted down. Shane gave Ian a malicious smile and swirled the wine in his glass, as if enjoying a good show. Ian's eyes narrowed, but he didn't look in Dr. Fulton's direction. Instead, he glanced at Madison. Would you like anything else to eat, my love? Gently, he told her. His tender words sounded softly in the silence, and Madison looked up at him in surprise. He raised his hand to her face and gently caressed the corner of her mouth, brushing his thumb over her pink lips. She gazed into his eyes and saw nothing but tenderness. If possible, the room became even quieter. Even the doctor who had tried to get Dr. Faldus to lay off the wine didn't know what to do. Shane's warm eyes suddenly widened, and he raised his glass in Ian's direction. Dr. Faldus felt extremely aggrieved. Otherwise, she would have never gotten this drunk. Although the red wine was of excellent quality, she had had too much and was exceptionally intoxicated. However, the alcohol in her system gave her courage. Ian, she exclaimed, her voice filled with hurt and sadness. She looked at him and pressed her palm against her heart. Can't you see me? Even when I throw away my self-esteem and pride and run around after you, you still can't see me. Why don't you look at me? What does he have that I don't tell me? No one dared speak. Dr. Lopez sat listening to her words and the corners of her mouth raised into a bitter smile. She sipped her wine in silence. From the moment the gathering had begun, it had been very clear to her that she would never stand by Ian's side as her partner. But she wasn't as daring as Dr. Faltus, and would never have said anything. In a way, she admired that her colleague was able to say what she thought to him. Ian still didn't react. He kept his palm on Madison's cheek. His eyes focused on her mouth. When she opened it to speak, he gave a small smile. Please be mindful of the occasion and have some self-respect, Dr. Faltus, she said, giving her a cold stare. Ian is my husband, and I will make sure to remind you of that if you keep on forgetting. You stop being so... pestering. She was angry. In the hospital... Dr. Faltus always acted as if she was Ian's partner. Many times when she had been there, she had heard nurses whispering about how she treated him and was always trying to please him. Just because nobody actually said it openly didn't mean that it wasn't happening. Madison had originally wanted to call her shameless, but she had decided to let her keep some of her dignity. Shut up, Dr. Faltus exclaimed, going all out under the influence of alcohol. She stood up and faced the couple. What the hell do you know? You just finished school, she snarled at Madison. You don't know what love is. You don't know what marriage is or what it means to have a family. Do you think he would have married you if it wasn't for your family? You have no right to be even looking at him. Madison was so angry that she started laughing. She sat up straight and prepared to retaliate. But Dr. Fultis was on a roll, and there was no stopping her. Without the slightest bit of consideration, she continued, Who do you think you are? You're in no position to speak to me like that. Everybody knows that you're just a replacement for Claire Thompson. Even the wedding was originally meant for her. She right as a substitute like you have to be arrogant with me. Didn't I say on television that Ian went to see Claire at her apartment on the day you were locked up? Did he go see you? No. Can you see... He doesn't care about you. Everyone was completely still, their eyes moving to see how Madison would react. The moment Dr. Faldus finished speaking, her face turned deathly pale. 
Madison grabbed the edge of the table to support herself, and Dr. Fulbus walked over, closing the distance between them. He bent over her and proudly raised her eyebrows. What? Do you think you've won? I can be Claire, but can you? And then make a scene. Let everyone see what you're like. You're pathetic. What a joke, she said with a victorious smile. The room remained quiet. Just when everyone thought that Madison was going to ignore Dr. Falta, she relaxed her body and leaned against the back of her chair. She crossed her arms and raised her eyebrows as she looked at the doctor hovering over her. Her smile was exceptionally gentle, like a breath of spring. Dr. Falta's face fell, and she asked, What are you smiling at? Madison scoffed and replied, Don't you know, I'm laughing at you. Do you think I'm a joke? Look at yourself. Ian frowned and watched his wife attentively. You've liked Ian for many years, right? I heard at the hospital that you've been chasing him around for ages, even when you knew that he had a girlfriend. And now you're still doing the same thing when he has a wife. Do you think that's love? Ignoring your behavior and forcing your affection on him? I know what you did at the hospital, but I won't say it here. Madison's words were soft, but her eyes were almost completely emotionless. They were cold and distant. Yes, Ian had a girlfriend before he was with me. So what? I also had a boyfriend. Ian and I got together after we were both single. You'd be singing a different tune if he had chosen to be with you instead. The people around suddenly saw Madison in a new light. While they had previously viewed her as young and immature, the way she spoke now was anything but that. Casually, she put a piece of fish on a plate and placed it in front of Ian. He's my husband, and there is no place for you in our relationship. We can only have one of us, and let me assure you that he would never choose you. He's already chosen me, Madison stated. Dr. Fulton glanced, and she trembled slightly. No matter what you try to tell yourself, or how dissatisfied you are with the situation, it is me who has taken his last name, and it is me who has registered as his spouse. We are husband and wife by law. Are you more powerful than the law? Madison seemed confident in her words. No one besides Jane noticed that she was putting up a front. She was pretending to be strong and unbothered, but her hand was grasping her napkin in a tight fist under the table, revealing her uneasiness. She frowned a little, and Jane looked at Ian, who was still just sitting there saying nothing. However, he was never as gentle and harmless as he looked on the surface. Madison stared straight into Dr. Fulda's eyes and told her, I have never seen Claire as a threat. She sounded harsh and arrogant, as she said this not only in front of the doctors and Shane, but also in front of Ian. Ian looked at her with eyes full of determination. First, Madison had seen her as a threat in the beginning, but now she didn't anymore. Her sixth sense was right as Ian barely had any feelings left for Claire. They had become obvious on several occasions. His handling of the situation during their wedding, his negligence of her at the hospital, and the way he had treated her at his apartment. Although Madison was not that experienced in love matters, she knew that if she wasn't contradicting her now, it only meant one thing, that she was saying the truth, and that she was very right to assume as much. Dr. Fultus opened and closed her mouth like a fish, struggling to find a good response. Madison had demolished her with her words, and she had become a laughingstock. Quickly, Ron stepped in to salvage the situation by bringing up another subject, and soon they all managed to move past the disruption. The atmosphere became convival again, as it had been before Dr. Fultus had created a scene. They all enjoyed the rest of the evening, when they left the Griffin, the diners were all somewhat drunk. Mr. Williams was in charge of sending everyone home in cabs. Only after the guests had left did he look over at the three remaining people. Ian, Madison, and Shane were all sitting near the window, the waiter serving them tea with a knowing look on his face. Madison sat on the couch looking out. It was early fall, and the night sky was full of stars. However, everything outside seemed cold 
and she shrunk back subconsciously. This is the first time that I've seen you get a case in the city, Ian told Payne. You're not here as a spy. He handed Madison a cup of tea, and she took it in her hands. She brought it up to her mouth, and it warmed her face. She looked at Ian in surprise. It seemed that the Westons and Crawfords weren't ordinary people at all. Usually, matters such as espionage were kept secret. Even Madison and Zack had only just heard that Shane had successfully solved an international case. However, Ian had known about it long before. Shane only smiled and said, I'm done with spying after this case. Is the case you're working on very dangerous? Madison asked. She was a little worried. His smile became gentler, and he reassured her softly. Not very much, no. All I'm doing is gathering information. The rest is out of my hands. Madison nodded and felt the tension in her chest ease. She thought for a moment and then smiled. Would you consider settling down? If you'd like, I know a few women that I could introduce you to. He raised her eyebrows at her while Ian looked puzzled. I know this lovely woman. She's 29. I think you'd like her. She has a wonderful personality, and she's really beautiful. Would you like me to set you up on a date? She asked timidly. In her heart, she was still hoping that Shane would come around and see Cassandra's worth. Ian's puzzled expression melted into a smile that only got wider with each word she said. However, the smile on Shane's face froze. Ian realized that Madison could be quite sly. She had found a way to bring up Cassandra in front of Shane without making the situation seem forced or awkward. It was a tactful way of mediating between the two men. Madison knew that Shane liked her. It was obvious to anyone that saw them together. And Shane had never tried to conceal his attraction. However, she was married to Ian and she wasn't about to bring any doubt into the marriage. She had made it clear from the beginning that her nice attitude didn't mean anything romantic. That's just how she was with everyone. Shane seemed hurt by what she had said, and he tried to cover it up with a joke. You can't go around matchmaking just because you've suddenly got married. I'm sure Shane can think about this himself, Ian said. Come on, let's go home, it's getting late. He held his jacket out for Madison, ready to leave. She was caught by surprise by the sudden change and turned to look at Shane. She smiled apologetically at him and let Ian lead her away. Shane laughed as he watched them walk out. Their relationship seemed very unstable. He was sure that if he waited for long enough, he could come to see them separate. However, he didn't know what the future would bring, and if he would ever get a chance with her. Ian and Madison walked out into the night. It was quite late, and the city gave off a feeling of luxury and loneliness. Ian drove them back to the apartment, and when he parked the car, he looked over to see that Madison had fallen asleep. Quietly, he got out of the car and gently picked her up, not wanting to wake her. In the elevator, she started moving uneasily and suddenly opened her eyes. Ian looked down at her, and he saw that her eyes were full of panic. She took a moment to realize where she was and let out a sigh of relief. Then she struggled to get out of his arms, and he set her down on the ground. She glared at him, and he frowned. You're angry, he stated. Her breathing paused and her eyes flashed. She turned away from him, refusing to reply. He wondered if she even knew what she was angry about. In the quiet elevator, Ian sighed and asked, Why are you angry? He didn't like guessing, but it seemed that his wife liked to hide her thoughts. Since she had first found out about Claire, and up until now, she was always keeping things from him. There was a long silence broken only by the ding of the elevator as it arrived at their floor. The door opened, and she made to step out, but Ian caught her by the wrist and held her back. She looked up at him, resigned. She knew that he would get the answer out of her that evening. She relaxed and leaned into him. Softly, she said, I can't be angry because you never allow me to be angry. How about that? Stand what I'm saying. She looked at him intently. Ian frowned at Madison and shook his head at her question. Do I understand? Of course not. How could I possibly understand such a nonsensical sentence, he thought. She looked straight at him and smiled. 
He was very good looking. He had deep eyes, a handsome nose, and full lips. Every glance of him made her catch her breath. He was her husband. But she had yet to let him into her heart completely. If he hadn't asked her why she was angry, she might have kept it to herself forever. She wouldn't have told him what she was feeling inside. However, she would always give an honest answer when asked a question. She was direct like that. She wouldn't lie. I haven't felt the slightest bit of security since we got married. Do you understand what I'm saying now? Her voice was low, and her warm breath swept across his face when she talked. He pulled her close to him and held her tightly. His brows knitted together, and he stared at her, waiting for her to continue. We've been together for two or three months now. Since we met, we've gone from being strangers to being an intimate couple, but before we got married, I felt so much more secure. Why is it that after getting married, I don't even have the confidence to speak anymore? She frowned at him. When Claire appeared at the ceremony, I couldn't say anything. I didn't even know she was your ex-girlfriend at the time. And when she appeared here, I was furious because I was defending my territory. This is my home, and I refused to let her enter here, even if the place was her shelter before. And when I was at the karaoke, what could have I done? All I was thinking about was your family. And today, when Dr. Fulton said those things... How could she see it any differently? In her eyes, I am the one who took her man and replaced her in your life. Her words struck Ian deeply, and it hurt so much to hear them that it suddenly made him think of what she had been like when he had met her. She had been impulsive and careless. He had always viewed that as a flaw and had used his methods to change her ways. But it was a good thing now, he thought. He wanted to speak, but she stopped him. I'm angry because you don't give me any confidence. If you let me know that I'm truly your wife, and that there's no one else in your life, then I can face all the rumors that keep popping up. I can even face Diana making things difficult. But you don't give me that confidence, she complained. As soon as she had finished speaking, she felt empty inside. This wasn't the first time she had felt this way. She had often had the same feeling since she had married Ian. She knew it was because he hadn't opened his heart up to her and accepted her. Perhaps he wouldn't hesitate anymore if they were to have a child together. She had to admit that he was a wonderful man, and it was easy to fall in love with him. And she did love him, but she was rational. She wouldn't let herself be blindly drawn to him like a moth to the flame. At least not for now. Ian frowned, seeming to finally understand her. The reason Madison didn't have confidence was that he didn't offer her a sense of security. Even though they were married, she still didn't feel like she belonged with him. They looked at each other, still standing in the elevator. After a long while, she suddenly heard herself speak. Firmly, yet somewhat anxiously, she asked, Can I love you? Because I do love you. He looked at her quietly without replying for a long time. Everything around them seemed to have stopped, and Madison suddenly found it hard to breathe. She pushed away from him and gave him a bitter smile. Even though she had mustered up the courage to confess her feelings, she still didn't have his love. It had all just been a dream. She thought of growing old like this, living for nothing. She turned her back to him and took a deep breath. Then she pressed the button that opened the doors. Before she walked out, she said, I'm sorry. I asked for too much. Just as she was about to put her foot through the door, he suddenly reached out and grabbed her again. In the next second, she was pressed against the elevator wall, still wearing his jacket. The door closed slowly once again as he leaned in to say, Are you crazy? I've already made you my wife. If that's not love, what is? Before the joy inspired by his words showed on her face, he stroked her chin with his hand and kissed her. Their lips pressed together and their breath blended. He pressed the elevator door open again, and pulled her into the apartment. Once inside, they were in the dark, with only the soft moonlight coming through the windows. She felt lightheaded. Madison was shy, but Ian was steady and confident. His hand went down to her waist, and he held her in place. He leaned forward as if trying to meld their bodies together. Madison tried hard to breathe, but she felt herself involuntarily stiffen. 
She tried her best not to struggle and she closed her eyes. She was trembling and her heart was pounding. All she felt was his hands on her waist and the heat of his body pressed against hers. By reflex, her hands went up to his chest, trying to push him away. However, he misread her actions and continued to kiss her, planting his lips on her cheeks, earlobes, and neck. It seemed so natural to him, and Madison tried to tell herself that she could do this. Don't struggle. Don't stop breathing. Don't freeze up. You can do it, she told herself. A tear fell from the corner of her eye. Suddenly, her eyes widened. The faint moonlight covered everything with a soft silver sheen, seeming unfamiliar and cold. Ian caressed her back, and as he tried to unbutton her blouse, her breathing quickened. He had been wanting to do this for so long. It had been torture sleeping next to her every night and not being able to touch her. At first, his actions didn't seem too strange. However, as he clung to his shoulders, terrified, her breath became more and more rapid. And suddenly, she stopped breathing altogether. She felt like she was drowning, desperately grasping for air. Madison, you coward, she scolded herself. She despised herself for her reaction. Her eyes were wide open in fright when she looked outside at the moon. As Ian ran his hands across her body, he noticed that something was wrong. She was tense and still, and he was the only one in the room who was breathing. His chest constricted, and he looked up at her face. She was completely still, just like a doll. He was horrified, wondering what would have happened if he hadn't noticed in time. Madison, he said sharply, taking her to the couch and laying her down. Panicked, he exclaimed, Madison, Madison, breathe, please breathe for me. He was getting really scared. He didn't know how long she hadn't been breathing, and his helplessness made him feel even more afraid. Suddenly, he didn't look at all like a doctor responsible for saving countless lives. Madison, he roared, shaking her hard. Her face was getting dangerously blue. Madison, breathe! She seemed lifeless. Everything was happening so fast. Suddenly, she snapped out of it and took a deep breath. Her body relaxed, and she began heaving deeply, leaning forward. In front of her, Ian was so scared that his legs gave away, and he fell to the ground. He stared at her blankly as she gulped down air, as he had just come back from the dead. Gradually, her breathing became normal again, but her body curled up in a small ball, and she stayed that way. She didn't react to Ian's presence. She just sat there, immobile. Tears pricked at her eyes, and her cheeks burned. You're such a coward, she told herself resentfully. Tears rolled down her cheeks and onto her knees, quickly sinking into the fabric of her trousers. Any normal man would surely discard her for reacting like this in an intimate situation. She didn't dare to think too much about whether Ian would desire her now. Why did he have to see me like this? Why did he have to see me so weak and pathetic? If I just tried a little harder, did a little better, I wouldn't be like this, she thought. The tears continued to flow, and she didn't dare make a sound. All she could do was cry silently and tremble in the moonlit room. A fragile, unbearable feeling rushed through her and settled in her brain and her heart. She didn't know what to do. She didn't know if she would be able to bear it or not. Later that night, Madison and Ian sat in silence in their new apartment. Madison kept her head lowered as she sobbed on the couch, while Ian sat on the carpet staring up at her. She didn't even dare to raise her head and Ian was trying hard to recover from the shock of almost losing her. He kept his gaze on her, making sure that her chest was moving and that she was breathing steadily. He wanted to go up to her and hold her in his arms. In the end, he couldn't help himself and did just that. As he enveloped her in a hug, she suddenly forgot to cry. Madison, Madison, he whispered into her ear, his voice tender and soothing. It was then that she completely broke down. The emotions she had been carrying around, pent up in her heart, suddenly flowed like water that had been released from a dam. Ian, I'm so afraid, she said, tears flowing. His heart ached. He held her in his arms until he was sure that she was okay. 
and only then did he allow himself to let out a sigh of relief. He watched her cry as if she were a little girl, and he began to wonder what had happened. What happened to her just now? He couldn't say how long she cried that night, but she didn't stop until she fell asleep. He didn't even have the chance to ask her what had upset her so much. With a frown, he watched her chest rise and fall in the gentle rhythm of slumber. Finally, he picked her up and carried her to bed. He stretched out his hand and smoothed her messy hair. The moment he left his embrace, she reached out and hugged the blanket instead, curling up. His frown deepened, and once again he wondered, what happened to her tonight? Ian left the bedroom and walked into the kitchen, where he quietly heated some milk. He poured a glass and drank it while pacing in the living room. His tall figure leaned against the wall where they had been together not long ago, and he casually reached out and turned off the lights. Silently, he looked around at the room and everything inside it. In front of the French window, the curtains were moving with the night breeze, and the moonlight bathed everything in a soft glow. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. So what was the matter with Madison? He stood there in the darkness, first for a minute, then for two, then for three, until he had been standing there for ten whole minutes and still hadn't found an answer. Feeling helpless, he poured another glass of milk and returned to the bedroom. Softly, he woke Madison up and gave her the milk to drink before she went back to sleep. If it wasn't a problem with their home, then it had to be a problem with people. That night, the whole world seemed restless. The following day, Madison woke up before dawn, but she didn't move at all. She just stayed where she was on the bed, looking at the gray sky outside the window. Summer had already passed, and fall had suddenly become exceptionally cold. It was as if the weather was mirroring what was in her heart. Everything that had happened the previous night replayed itself in her mind like a movie. She could feel every touch and every breath. She could feel that same feeling of weakness, and it caused her breathing to quicken once more. She closed her eyes and relived it all. There was a certain kind of magic to Ian's touch, and when she remembered his hands coming into contact with her skin, she began to tremble, her entire world collapsing. She opened her eyes quickly and bit her lips hard to hold back her sobs. Tears fell onto the pillow and she felt completely helpless. She wanted to stop thinking about it all. Suddenly, a warm arm quietly wrapped itself around her waist. She reacted to the touch by taking in a sharp breath. But Ian didn't move away. He just held her tightly as she slept. After a few seconds, she let out a sigh. All her previous efforts seemed to have been in vain because the night before, she had felt a sense of danger when Ian had touched her like this. She adjusted her breathing slowly and finally closed her eyes again, exhausted. After a long time, Ian opened his eyes sleepily. His gaze fell on his arm that was wrapped around his wife, and his eyes narrowed. I wonder if it's all right to touch her, he thought. When she woke up again, it was already ten o'clock in the morning. Ian had left for the hospital and she was alone. She stayed in bed for a long time before getting up and calling Anna to tell her that she was resigning. On the other end of the line, Anna protested, but in the end, she gave in. However, she was very unhappy to have let Madison go. Madison hung up the phone and sat alone on the couch, frowning. After the previous night, Ian must have felt something change. She needed to know how she could turn the situation around. She was cold in that respect because she had a fear of sex. But how do I tell him that? She sighed heavily closed her eyes and leaned against the backrest. It had never been easy for her to keep men from getting close to her. She hadn't resisted Ian's care or his kisses, but she still seemed to overcome the anxiety that she felt about taking things to the next level. Even now, she felt her entire body go cold to the bone every time she thought about what happened to her when she was just ten years old. Ian. Ian, now that you know how pathetic I am, Will you treat me differently, she thought. Meanwhile, at Mercy Hospital, Claire got around all obstacles and finally managed to see Ian. A few days had passed since the incident with Madison and Lynn. 
The man who had once been her boyfriend now treated her so ruthlessly, all for the sake of another woman. Just after Ian had finished working, the door to his office was violently pushed open. You can't go in the... Linda stood behind the door, trying to stop Claire from entering the office. However, the young dancer interrupted her words by swinging the door open. Linda turned her head to Ian with an apologetic look on her face and said, I'm so sorry, she... It's fine, go back to work, he told her, motioning for her to go. She nodded and left, closing the door carefully. Claire almost broke down in tears when she saw Ian. Her lips trembled and she looked rather pitiful. However, she was also incredibly stubborn. After some time, when no words had yet been spoken, Ian finally asked, Miss Thompson, is there something you would like to talk to me about? At the sound of the formal address, she finally began crying. Why would he call me that, she thought. Why are you doing this to me? She asked, her voice trembling. No matter how strong or stubborn she was, she was a person and she also had a heart. Do you have to keep destroying me like this? Do you hate me that much? What do you mean? He asked, his eyebrows raised. Suddenly, she became very angry with how he was playing dumb. She took a step forward and raised her voice. Think I'm some fool. I've been rejected by foreign dance companies. Do you know what that means? I have reporters following me around everywhere. Are you wondering what I intend to do? I know you're behind all of this. Don't think that I can't see right through you. She'd been going crazy over the past few days. Lynn was also aggravated, but her family wasn't letting her leave the house. Claire was alone in this. Is this really that important to you? You've only been with her for two or three months. How can that replace the years we spent together? She looked at him in disbelief. Because of you, no foreign performance group has dared to accept me. I know you had something to do with that. But if you stop to think of the harm that's been done to my reputation, can't you see the situation I'm in? I have no status in my family. My parents haven't even asked me about what happened that day. Do you still have the heart to do this to me? There are reporters camped outside my house pestering me. People are tailing me. I need you to stop this. She ended up shouting at him as if he had done something unforgivable. However, Ian only watched her calmly and waited for her to finish speaking. When she was done, he said, So now you've experienced what it's like to have the public against you. She surely hadn't thought of that when she had tried to hurt Madison. He was just giving her a taste of her own medicine. Claire took a step back. So everything you did, it was all to give Madison justice, right? She asked. I tarnished her reputation, and you did the same to me. It was always about Madison. It was never about the Weston family. He frowned, but didn't reply. Did she really do it for Madison and not the family? And why do I care so much? He wondered. He hadn't actually expected to achieve his goal. Suddenly, she took a step forward and grabbed onto his shirt. She leaned toward him with tears in her eyes. Her face was beautiful and familiar, but there was no tenderness left in his eyes when he looked back at her. You loved me once. How can you treat me like this? You know how hard it is for me at home. Didn't you think of that when you decided to attack me? And would you have done this to me if I had been your wife? The question splitted through her mind in quick succession. Ian raised his head to silently stare at the frantic woman in front of him. He watched the tears stream down Claire's face and realized they had no effect on him. All Madison ever did to draw his concern was a frown, but he couldn't care less that his ex-girlfriend was crying now. Ian... Ian! Claire cried through her sobs. Her head was bowed and she reached out to grab his shirt as she asked, Ian, are you in love with Madison? I don't even know the answer to that question, he thought, at a loss for how to reply. Her sobs quieted down as she stared at him with a burning gaze, silently waiting for his answer. However, he just looked at her without speaking. Suddenly, she burst into laughter which sharply broke the silence in the office. Her laughter was filled with sadness and mockery as she said, You actually... 
You actually fell in love with her. She cackled like a hyena as he continued. For two years, you never gave me the slightest bit of warmth. But her, it's been less than three months since we broke up, and she's already stolen your heart. The woman laughed so hard that she couldn't even catch her breath. You actually fell in love with her. Ian frowned deeply as his thoughts drifted to Madison's reaction to him the night before. He reached out and pried Claire's hands away from his clothes before taking a step back and announcing, Miss Thompson, I think you should leave. After that, he walked toward the door. She was still giggling furiously, though tears had started to stream down her face once more. When he was about to step out, she suddenly rushed over and grasped his arm. She reached out her other hand and grabbed his head, crying as she pulled him toward her, pressing her lips against his. With a click, the door to the office suddenly opened, and a hush descended. Madison stood at the door with Ron behind her. Both of them held their breath and wished they could erase this image from their memories. Ian and Claire's lips were pressed against each other. She was crying while his hands had a firm grip on her waist. The onlookers couldn't tell if he was trying to push her away or pull her closer. Madison stood in a daze, completely unsure of how to react. She just stared blankly at the two of them, her hand unconsciously tightening on her bag. It only lasted a few moments, but for Madison, it felt like a lifetime. Not long after Claire had pulled him toward her, Ian pushed her away and she drew back. One of her hands was still holding his arm, and the other was placed on his chest. She turned to the doorway and with a smirk she jeered, Hello, Mrs. Weston. How are you? With that, everyone was pulled back to reality, though they were all at a loss for words. Claire looked smug, as though she was proud of a great accomplishment. Ron's eyes started back and forth between the other three before he seemed to make a decision. He quickly pulled Madison further into the room and closed the door behind them. Madison's eyes shifted from Claire's smirk to Ian's face, which was full of anxiety and doubt. She couldn't tell what her husband was thinking or feeling. However, after the previous night... She had more confidence in his feelings. She was still his wife at the end of the day, so she decided to believe that he was genuine and that this was a misunderstanding. What are you doing here, Claire? She inquired, nonchalantly walking around them to Ian's desk, picking up his glass and drinking all the water in it. Turning back around, she continued, Is this your latest attempt to win my husband back? Claire's brows twitched in confusion but the smirk stayed on her face. Her heart sank as she realized her strategy wasn't going according to plan. Aren't you going to fight for him? She responded, raising her chin up to challenge the other woman. Madison didn't say anything at first, and said smiling gently as she gazed at Ian. After a few moments, she replied, That depends on whether there's anything to fight against. Whether or not there's something between the two of you isn't up to me. It was quite awkward for Ron, who was trying to be quiet and remain unnoticed, since it was too late for him to leave now. If he opened the door, he would give anyone that may be in the hallway a front row seat to a very private problem. Claire's confusion deepened, and she turned back to look at Ian. Ron peered up as well, wanting to see what the man's reaction would be. She doesn't have my wife's beauty and wisdom, so no, there's nothing between us, Ian stated still not breaking free from Claire's grip. He just narrowed his eyes and looked at his wife as the corner of his mouth rose. Claire's face darkened as he watched the couple interact. They're not taking me seriously at all, she realized. Ian's mood had dramatically improved. Originally, when Claire had kissed him, he had been shocked and upset. And when he realized his wife had seen him, he had started to panic. Now that he was sure she was on his side... His heart was much lighter. Madison's eyes narrowed as they dropped to the hand that Claire still had on Ian's arm. He looked down at it before glancing back at his wife, waiting to see what she would do. Madison clenched her jaw and strode forward to slap Claire's hand away and pull Ian toward her. Claire, I doubt your parents are aware that you're behaving like this. She sneered, 
I wonder how furious they would be if they knew that you were doing this. Claire glared back at her and said, We'll see if you end up better off than me. Who knows? In two years, you might be the one trying to get Ian back. With that, she turned on her heel and left, leaving the door open as she went. Ron quickly took advantage of the opportunity to slip away, leaving the young couple alone in the office. Madison's chest was heaving as she breathed heavily, her heart racing. The memory of her and Ian the night before, and the image of him kissing Claire kept alternating in her mind. I wish I could just reach into my mind and take this memory out, she thought. As Ian gazed at her from behind, his eyes drifted, and he couldn't help but be distracted by her figure. Autumn was in full swing now, and her summer dresses and skirts had shifted to jeans which accentuated her slim legs. As his eyes slid back up, he noticed that her blouse highlighted her small waist. When he looked at her face, he saw her throat bob as she swallowed hard. He frowned as he thought of what had happened that morning. Madison, he murmured, moving closer to her and resting a hand on her waist as he carefully observed her. Unlike that morning, she hardly reacted at all. Almost as if the whole incident had been a dream. Why are you here? He tried to calm the swirl of complicated emotions he felt as he gazed at her. She looked back up at him, feeling her confidence shatter when she saw his face. Her lipstick is all over his mouth, she thought with a frown. Feeling her fury rising, she took a tissue out of her bag and started to wipe his face with short, rough stroke. There was no gentleness in her movements and Ian's lips started to sting after a minute. Her face was tense and angry, her brows were deeply furrowed, and her jaw was clenched. He had naively thought that she would have been indifferent, or at least calmer if something like this were to happen. Clearly, she had gotten very jealous at the sight of Claire kissing him. When Ian couldn't bear her rough movements any longer, he grabbed her hand and remarked, Okay, okay, I think you've got it all. Madison stopped and stared at him with a face full of sadness. She didn't speak, and her eyes bored into him like she was searching for something. It made his heart hurt to look at her. Since was my mood so easily affected by her, he wondered. Lately, it had seemed like the slightest emotion from her tugged violently at his heart. He reached his hand up toward her cheek, but he paused halfway as he considered what Claire had said. Are you in love with Madison? A warm feeling filled his chest, but right at that moment, a single tear fell down his wife's cheek. When he saw her crying, he knew the truth. I really have fallen in love with her. There's no denying it at this point, he realized. His arm wrapped fully around her waist, and he pulled her close as he heard her ask, Ian, if you decided you didn't want me anymore, I don't know what I would do. That sentence reflected her anxiety. His heart melted, and, in an attempt to cheer her up, he joked, That must be why you keep me at an arm's length in the bedroom. However, he didn't know the impact those words would have on his wife. That afternoon, instead of bringing Madison back to their apartment, Ian brought her to his family's house. The Weston family had a tradition of gathering once a week for a meal. Everyone who was in town had to come, with no exceptions. When the young couple pulled up to the mansion, they saw Daniel and Cassandra playing in the front yard with the family dog, Bo. Ian's siblings went to greet them, and Daniel teased, What happened to your mouth? Do I to tell Madison to go easy on you? Ian and Cassandra grinned in response, but Madison felt something that she couldn't quite put into words. She relaxed once they had gotten away from the office, and she felt awkward at the joke. It wasn't as though she wanted to care that Ian's mouth was raw because of her jealous effort to wipe away every trace of Claire. She took a breath and decided to put that behind her, focusing instead on what was right in front of her. You think you're so funny, Cassandra responded, laughing as she pulled Madison over toward the dog so they could play with him together. Ian, go take a shower and change your clothes. Dinner should be ready soon. Ian did as he was told, while Daniel leisurely walked back over to the two women. The family dog was a husky, and Diana absolutely adored him, 
He had that in common with Madison, who loved dogs, especially huskies. Go get it, Daniel shouted as he threw the dog's ball as hard as he could. Bo sprinted over and pounced on it. As Bo was running back toward him, Daniel glanced at Madison and asked, Are you going to have kids soon? Madison was surprised at the sudden topic change. She turned to her siblings in law and saw that they were smiling back at her. Every time Daniel smiled, he looked like he was posing for the cover of a magazine. With his mouth turned up into a crooked grin, Cassandra's smile at the moment was tighter, as though she felt awkward at her brother's question. Madison opened her mouth to respond, but her voice was stuck in her throat, and she couldn't say a word. Bo brought the ball back and wagged his big tail to beg for Daniel to throw it again. The man obliged before he continued. It's good to take things slow and wait until you're both ready. Grandma's getting older, though, and I'm sure she'd love to meet her great-grandchild. It doesn't look like Cassandra or I am going to have kids in the foreseeable future. So, if you're on the fence, I think you should just go for it. The whole family would be so excited. Madison had never thought that Daniel would say something like that. The pressure she had already felt from the Weston family grew even stronger and she felt as though she was being backed into a corner. She thought, At this point, everyone has made comments about us having children. Even Ian mentioned having a baby the first time we met his family. Why can't anyone give me some space to think about this? If she could overcome the trauma from her past, then maybe she would feel ready to bring the next generation of Westons into the world. After the previous night, however, she didn't think that was likely to happen any time soon. Daniel didn't seem to realize the impact of what he had said, and he carelessly ran across the yard with Bo, who chased him in excitement. Cassandra was standing right next to Madison, and she noticed her sister-in-law wasn't happy about Daniel's little speech. She leaned close and remarked, It's okay not to be ready. Try to ignore the pressure from everyone and just do what's right for you. With that, Madison suddenly understood why Daniel had felt the need to speak up. Her sister-in-law had been in love with Shane for a long time, and she hadn't thought twice about spending her youth waiting for him to notice her. Clearly, the rest of the family wasn't thrilled about her decision to stay single and wait to have children. Are they hoping that she'll change her mind if Ian and I have a baby? Madison wondered. She didn't say anything, and her emotions were whipping around like a tornado. But she managed to smile and nod politely. Originally, she had thought that marrying Ian would be a temporary measure. Being married would allow her to be independent of her family and work on her career, and eventually she could get a divorce. Now, however, she knew that wasn't realistic. There was no longer any doubt in her mind that she was in love with Ian, and she couldn't just walk away from him. On top of that, she had stopped working at Green, and she was done with school. From her in-law's perspective, she was in the perfect position to focus on starting a family. None of that helped her overcome the hurdle in her heart. A while later, with her emotions firmly squashed down to confront later, Madison went up to let Ian know that dinner was ready. As soon as she opened the door to his room, she blessed at the shocking sight that greeted her. She quickly closed the door behind her as she stepped in and turned away from him with her hand on her mouth. Ian had just come out of the bathroom, and he was only wearing a towel around his waist. When he heard his wife come in, he turned toward the door. There was no trace of nervousness on his face. There were still water droplets on his body as he looked at Madison, who still had her back to him. He smiled at her affectionately, and he stopped gathering his clothes together. I'm sorry, I didn't know you weren't dressed. She managed to squeak out. Calming down a bit, he stammered, I... I came to tell you that dinner's ready. I can... I'll just go. As she finished speaking and moved to open the door, Ian came up behind her and grabbed her wrist. Her face was scarlet as she hesitantly turned to face the half-naked man. She carefully averted her eyes to avoid staring at his figure. I... I... she stuttered, which her husband thought was adorable. Seems familiar, don't you think? he teased. That triggered the memory of the first time Madison had met him. It was very similar, though she was somehow even more embarrassed this time. Her eyes flashed up to meet his, and her mouth fell open as she remembered that day. Ian was mesmerized by her expression, 
and he reached out to lift her chin with his hand. She stole my heart. It's only fair she repays me a little, he thought. The faint smell of his soap filled her nose, and her hands unconsciously climbed onto his bare chest. Her breathing quickened, but it wasn't as sharp or panicked as it had been the night before. Ian kissed her, but he was focused on her reaction, and he moved slowly and deliberately. She kissed him back and didn't protest in any way when he wrapped an arm around her and drew her close. When he pulled back, her skin was blessed red. She leaned into his embrace as he breathed heavily. Maybe she really is in love with me. If that look isn't love, I don't know what is, he mused as he gazed at her. Leaning on her husband, she felt like she was floating. She heard his voice as if it was echoing from the sky as he teased. I just brushed my teeth so I know I don't have bad breath. There's no reason to push me away now. He pulled away, and she reached up to touch her lips. Taking a deep breath, she could smell the lingering scent of mint that he had left behind. At seven o'clock in the evening, everyone was present in the dining room of the Weston Mansion other than Diana. Olivia smiled as she placed some salad on a plate for her daughter-in-law and announced, Madison isn't working at the moment, so now that she's well-rested, maybe there will be time to bring a new addition to the family. The Westons all lit up at that declaration. It had been a long time since the family had given the good news that hadn't been marred by some kind of downside. If a new baby was around, everyone thought that would be wonderful. Everyone, except Madison, Ian thought, noticing that her fingers trembled as she reached for her salad plate. His eyes narrowed as he made note of her reaction, but he chose not to point it out. Instead, he asked, You're not working anymore? Olivia and Edward glanced at each other in surprise, since they had assumed Ian would know that his wife had left her job. Even Daniel and Cassandra turned to the young couple, looking puzzled. Madison saw everyone's eyes on her as she muttered, No, I just quit my job at the Green and decided to take a break. I don't feel like I'm at my best right now. Silence weighed heavily in the room, and everyone could tell that Ian wasn't happy. His lips were pursed as he peered at his wife. He knew how much she valued having some level of financial independence. Previously, she had mentioned wanting to continue her studies at some point in the future. He knew her past had made her leery of being too dependent on others. She finally got a job so she could make her own money, and she'd just given that up. She didn't even mention anything about it to me, he thought in confusion. Madison didn't elaborate on her statement though she did shoot Ian a smile as he passed him one of the dishes. After a few minutes, the tension in the atmosphere started to fade. The rest of the meal passed awkwardly, and only Daniel made an effort to make conversation. After everyone was done, Ian reached out and took his wife's hand, expecting to leave and head to their apartment. Before they could walk out, Olivia ordered one of the housekeepers to fetch a few boxes and put them in Ian's car. She reminded Madison... Don't forget to use these herbs and essential oils. They're supposed to boost your health, and there's information about them in the boxes. I'll send some more over later if you think you'll run out. Even though Olivia was vague, everyone knew that when she said they were meant to boost health, she meant that they would boost fertility. Ian could feel Madison's hand stiffen in his, and he looked at her thoughtfully, but stayed silent. Although this was far from the first time Madison had eaten with the Westons, she thought it had been the most exhausting occasion to date. Since Diana wasn't there, she had hoped it would be easier. But that had been foolish optimism. As they headed home in the luxury SUV, Madison opened the window to allow the crisp air to blow in and leaned her head on the door. Ian looked at her and narrowed his eyes. He wasn't sure what was going on with her, but he intended to get to the bottom of it. Late that night, Madison leaned her back against the cold wall in the bathroom as steam filled the space. She covered her face and took an unsteady breath before sinking to the ground in tears. She couldn't get her in-laws out of her head, and their comments ran through her mind in a never-ending loop. Everyone would be so excited. Maybe there will be time to bring a new addition into the family. Do what's right for you. 
They're supposed to boost your health. She'd love to meet her great-grandchild. The tragic part of the situation was that Madison truly did want a child. But she couldn't get past the horrible memories that still lingered in her head. The bright lights in the bathroom were a stark contrast to her mood as she hugged her knees tightly to her chest. As she bit her lips, images from one of the worst times in her life kept flashing through her mind. Thirteen years before, she had fallen into the pool. She had been unable to breathe and had started drowning. Suddenly, someone saved her and took her to her room. But her rescue had quickly turned sour. Still on the floor of the bathroom, she took in a shuddering breath as she remembered the pair of hands that had wandered over her body. In the darkness of her room, she had opened her eyes to see a horrifying face staring back at her, wearing a strange, sinister smile. She had wanted to cry, to scream, to do something, but she hadn't. Those hands had drifted around, indifferent to the paralyzing fear that was keeping her frozen in place. Suddenly, the man's ragged breathing filled her memory as the steam continued to fill the bathroom. She could hear the sound of water flowing in the shower, which got distorted into a loud, rushing sound in her head. She held her breath as her face twisted and distorted. Looking slowly around the bathroom, she tried to maintain her grip on the present. Her hands released her legs and started to flail around in search of something to anchor her in the here and now. Unable to find anything to help her, she leaned over and rested her head on the floor. She panted in quick, short gasps as her tears fell to the cold tile, and she curled her body up into a tight ball. Her hands twisted into her hair and her eyes squeezed shut. I can't do this anymore. It's been 13 years. I should be able to face this, she thought in despair. No matter what, the face she had seen in the darkness seemed to be stuck in her mind. As she opened her eyes, she thought that she saw the face right in front of her, and she was so startled that she screamed. A second later, the bathroom door was kicked open with a bang. When she lifted her head to see what had happened, it was Ian's face in front of her. When she saw him, she screamed again and scuttled into the corner of the shower, shrinking her body to be as small as possible. Her hand shot out to keep him at bay as he sobbed and shrieked, Go away! Go away! She yelled, as though she didn't recognize her husband. When he took a step closer, she shouted, Don't come closer, please! Go away! Go away! Ian stared at his wife in shock. He had no idea what was going on or how to help her. Her long hair was draped over her shoulders, and she was still wearing all her clothes, which were soaking wet. It wasn't clear whether or not she had fallen, but the red mark on her forehead was particularly concerning. Her eyes were filled with fear and anger as she looked in his direction, but they darted around and seemed unfocused, as though she really wasn't seeing him. A moment later, her hands started grabbing everything within reach and throwing it at him. Soap. Shampoo. A towel, a lupa. She frantically hurled everything she could get her hands on. Ian had never seen her like this. Although he didn't know what to do, he wasn't afraid. All he could feel was a pain as he stared at her, knowing that whatever was wrong wasn't physical. He stood near the door to the bathroom, unsure if she would let him get closer. Silently, he listened to her scream, listened to her shout for him to go away. Watched her coil herself into a ball in the corner, and watched her pull her hair. Don't! Please, don't! Madison cried, her movements gradually calming down as she huddled behind the stream of water coming from the shower head. She sobbed hysterically as she wrapped her arms around her legs once again. Every time Ian heard the heart-wrenching words she uttered, he felt like he was being stabbed. Please, don't! Don't do this to me! Frozen in place, his face was taut and enraged. His hands had clenched into fists as they hung by his side. What the hell happened? Who hurt her? He wondered furiously. At that moment, his mind was racing with all kinds of possibilities. The only thing he could do was to stand at a distance to help Madison feel safe. He looked at her, his heart full of pain. The bathroom was filled with steam, but he could see her clearly. Her fear and powerlessness were written all over her body. After a long time, he tried to take a small step closer to her. 
softly calling out, Madison? She suddenly froze. She lifted her head and her eyes moved slowly around the room, as if she were looking for something. Madison, she called again, slightly louder. She looked like a drowning person who had finally been thrown a life draft. Her puffy eyes zeroed in on her face, and she seemed to recognize him at last. Ian, she called weakly, uncurling herself and opening her arms to him. Almost instantly, he rushed toward her, not caring about the fact that the water was still running. At that moment, all he could see was Madison. He pulled her into his arms and surrounded her as much as he could, as if protecting her from an attack. The tower quickly soaked his clothes, and the steam made the air heavy and difficult to breathe in. But he didn't care. He just held his wife against him. Ian! Ian! She whimpered, tightly grabbing at his shirt to pull him as close to her as possible. Her whole body trembled uncontrollably as she chanted his name like a prayer. Ian! Ian! I'm here! It's okay, I'm right here! He patiently responded. She repeated his name repeatedly and he reassured her every time. Later, when Ian had managed to coax Madison out of the bathroom, she lay on the bed holding a mug of hot tea. Her face was so pale it made her husband's heart ache, and her normally sharp eyes stared ahead like she was a zombie. Drink your tea. It'll help. His voice was barely more than a whisper as he tried to comfort her. Slowly, he sat on the other side of the bed and scooted closer to her watching her face carefully to be sure he wasn't making her uncomfortable. She drank her tea numbly. Her mind was blank, and her heart felt like it had been wrung out like a wet rag. Time barely registered for her, and she was surprised when Ian reached out to take her cup, which she hadn't realized was empty. Her bloodshot eyes bore into him as she bit her lips hard to keep herself from crying. He smiled softly and stretched out his hand to gently soothe her hair. He ventured to ask, Do you want to talk about it? You don't have to, but if it would help, I'm here. Her lips trembled, but she didn't respond. Ian accepted her silence patiently and didn't speak again for a few minutes. Why don't we go to sleep? I'm sure you're tired. Tomorrow I can run to the store and pick up some groceries. You haven't tried my cooking yet, so I'll make something special. Finally, he suggested... The resistance in Madison's heart started to fade in the face of her husband's gentle comfort. Ian, she cried, leaning toward him as a rogue tear fell down her cheek. What should we do? What should I do? Her thoughts raced anxiously. What if I can't get past this? Will we ever be able to be a normal couple? She worried. Ian, he muttered, unable to say anything else. He wrapped his arms around her and drew her close again as he whispered reassurances to her. Whatever is going on, we can deal with it tomorrow. I don't need to know right now, he decided. As a doctor, he knew very well that her emotions were still raw. This had clearly been building up for a while, judging by her behavior at the family dinner earlier. Originally, he had hoped to get her to talk about what was going on, but that didn't seem likely now. Peering down at her, she dozed off in his arms. His eyes narrowed. What is it that she won't tell me? He thought it must be bad if she can't bring herself to say it out loud. Some things were too difficult to talk about. Whatever had happened, it wasn't something she was going to open up about easily. Ian had always felt that problems should be faced head on, but this was beyond his experience. He knew that sometimes when you face difficult things, it would get worse before it got better. All he could do was hope that he could help Madison through this crisis. Trigger warning. The following episode contains an event of rape, which some listeners may find disturbing. It is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. The rumor mill had exploded with gossip growing like weeds in the early spring. Almost every piece of news that Madison heard seemed to be related to her. The Thompsons, who have been held in high regard for generations, are now embedded in a scandal. We're astounded by Lynn Morris's arrogance and the indulgence of her family. 
Kelsey Morris is rumored to have seduced her sister's boyfriend in order to marry into the Morris family. Madison Weston seems to be trying to innocently live a low-profile life. Whether it was about the Thompsons, the Greenwalds, or the Morrises, everything was fair game to the reporters after the incident between her and Kelsey. At the moment, Madison was the favorite topic of every news outlet in the region. Ever since quitting her job, Madison had been trying very hard to work through the difficult parts of her past. Like every day when Ian went to work, she had stayed home and was ruminating over her memories in the hope that she could move past them. Her whole body was covered in sweat, and she fell to the floor. Her hands were shaking, and she bit her lips to prevent herself from crying. Why can't I even think about what happened back then? Why can't I work through them? She wondered. There was a sad smile on her pale face. She worried that if this continued, not only would she not be able to have a child with Ian, but he would divorce her eventually. Unexpectedly, someone rang the doorbell. Surprised, she stood up and took a few deep breaths to calm herself down before she walked over to answer the door. Her emotions were all over the place at the moment, so she unfortunately didn't think to check who was there before opening it wide. Immediately, there were flashes from cameras as multiple people started shouting at once, Mrs. Weston, what do you think about the video that your sister released online? A reporter called out. Mrs. Weston, how do you feel about what happened back then? Another one asked. Blinking in shock, Madison tried to process the fact that a dozen or so reporters were crowded around her front door. What are they talking about? What video? What incident? She wondered in confusion. Did Dr. Weston know what happened to you? How does the Weston family feel about this matter? Somebody questioned. Mrs. Weston, can you reveal the identity of the person who molested you? Madison felt as though she had been struck by lightning as she realized what they were interrogating her about. She was powerless to stop them as the reporters pushed past her and swarmed into the living room. Shaking as she retreated to the corner of the room, her pale face was full of disbelief. They continued to berate her with questions as she stared back blankly, unable to even form a complete thought. Mrs. Weston, what do you remember about the incident? Was the man who molested you a member of your family? Mrs. Weston, can you describe what happened when you were molested? Mrs. Weston, can you remember how you felt at the time? Mrs. Weston, when was the last time you had contact with the man who molested you? The cameras flashed wildly in front of her. The faces of the reporters seemed to expand and then shrink as they swayed in and out of her vision. All of a sudden, it was like she had gone deaf. There was no sound at all among the flashing lights. She could see the reporters open and close their mouths, as well as the excitement and curiosity on their faces. But nothing they said reached her. Even though it felt like an eternity to Madison, it only took a few minutes for the building's security guards to rush into the apartment. However, there were too many reporters to escort out. All they could do was stand in front of Madison and try to keep them back. Suddenly... All the noise around her seemed to break through her days. She felt simultaneously overwhelmed and numb, which must have shown on her face since the reporters looked at her with a renewed sense of excitement. The lights kept flashing furiously as the news hounds quieted down, hoping she would make a statement. A moment later, Madison opened her mouth, but nothing came out. She wanted to scream, but she couldn't make a sound. Her hands reached up to tangle in her hair as her breathing grew more and more rapid. Go away. Please don't do this to me. Go away. She wanted to yell at them, but her voice wouldn't cooperate. Tears streamed down her face, but no one made an attempt to help her. The guards were busy keeping the reporters back, and the reporters kept shouting questions, unbothered by her obvious distress. Mrs. Weston, were you about to make a statement? What do you want everyone to know? Mrs. Weston, did you know the man who assaulted you? Mrs. Weston, you took a virginity test recently. Was this real or were you covering up your assault? Mrs. Weston, what did your husband think about your childhood trauma? Madison couldn't take it anymore. 
and she dropped to the floor and curled up in her body as tightly as she could, thrusting herself into the corner. Her hands moved to cover her ears, but she could still hear their unsympathetic clamoring. She could hear the reporters getting closer as the security guards struggled to keep them back. No matter what they did, however, she still couldn't get herself to make a sound. She was powerless to do anything except sit and wait for the image of her cowering in a corner to end up on the news. Their questions were muffled, and although she could hear them laughing, she didn't know what it was about. She couldn't move, couldn't speak, couldn't do anything. All she could think about was how badly she wanted to throw herself into Ian's arms. Just like that night in the bathroom. She couldn't imagine feeling safe anywhere else at that moment. What the hell do you think you're doing? A man's voice roared angrily, causing the whole room to instantly fall silent. Madison heard the voice and looked up when everyone quieted down. The reporters had all turned around to look at Zack, who had just come into the apartment. Suppressing the rage that was simmering inside him, he strode toward his sister. The hack backed away and let him through, afraid of the fierce expression on his face. Most of them didn't dare provoke him. One reporter, however, fearlessly stepped forward and asked, Mr. Greenwald, before today, were you aware that your sister had been assaulted as a child? Did you find out who was responsible? Was Mrs. Weston harmed? After he finished speaking, the room was filled with tension. All of the reporters looked at Zack with anticipation and curiosity. He abruptly stopped walking toward Madison when he heard the question. Stiffly turning his head, he glared at the man who had dared to speak. His voice was deceptively calm as he replied, Are you talking to me? The reporter was surprised at the response, but he hoped this meant that Zack would be willing to speak with him. He nodded and confirmed, Yes, Mr. Greenwald, could you tell us how your family reacted to the situation back then? Or how your sister got away from her attacker? With that, the reporter held the microphone out with a face full of anticipation. Zack squared his feet to face the reporter head on. Before anyone could react, he raised his fist and punched him in the face, sending the man stumbling to the ground. There was a shocked silence. After a few moments, the others recovered and started to frantically take pictures of both Zack and the injured reporter. You want me to answer you, he yelled as he reached out to grab the man's collar and pull him back up. Here's your answer. He punched him again, then again. The room was in chaos. Zack wouldn't let go of the journalist, who seemed unable to stand. The sounds of his yells and punches were mixed with the furious clicking of the cameras, people shouting at Zack, and Madison sobbing as she hid her face in her knees. It was a mess. An end table had gotten knocked over, sending glasses and a lamp flying to the ground where they shattered. The beating scared the people at the scene so much that most ended up standing there in silent shock. Finally, when the reporter on the ground started apologizing, Zack stood up and pulled his tie down. Turning to the others with a terrifying look on his face, he demanded, Who else has questions about my sister? No one made a sound. Even the flashing of the cameras had stopped. When he glared at them, all to his satisfaction, he announced, All of you are trespassing on private property. Rest assured, we'll be pressing charges against each and every one of you. You can think about your disgusting behavior when you're sitting in a cell. Then he turned and walked over to the corner where his sister was still huddled, his face softening as he saw the state she was in. Since the situation had calmed down a bit, the security guards quickly started to usher the media hacks out. Most of them took the opportunity to leave, hoping that they would escape prosecution. However, some reporters were brave enough to hover and watch the pair of siblings. Madison, Zack called softly. She looked so fragile that he was afraid his voice would frighten her if he spoke too loudly. The remaining reporters observed them curiously, but none of them dared to speak by that point. After a moment, the last holdouts gave up and left the apartment. Madison, 
Zack called out to his sister. He reached out his hand but stopped when he noticed her tremble. He neither moved forward nor retreated. His eyes were full of love as he spoke to her. Hey, it's me. It's Zack. That seemed to pull her back into reality. There was a dazed look on her face as she raised her head, and as soon as her eyes focused on her brother, she cried, Zack! At the sound of her weak voice, Zack felt like he might cry. In the next second, she lunged forward into his arms. He had rushed over the instant he had found out what Kelsey had done, but he hadn't been prepared for what he would find. It had been difficult enough to see what she had been going through in the police station, but this was infinitely worse. Zack! Zack! She chanted in relief as he clung to him. To her, Zack was more than just a big brother. He was the only person she had always been able to rely on. It's okay. I'm here. I'm going to protect you. He assured her. She sobbed harder in response, and he held her tightly in silent comfort. A burst of hurried footsteps came through the door. She recoiled against her brother in fear. He didn't turn to see who it was, and instead glared out of the corner of his eye as the person approached. The footsteps stopped when they reached the siblings, and Madison's heart leaped into her throat when she heard Ian's voice call her name. Madison. While she didn't lift her head away from Zack, her crying stopped. For a moment, no one spoke or moved. Ian didn't have the words that could describe what he was feeling just then. He had been dealing with matters at the Pink Star Hotel when he got the news. Guilt warred with anger inside him, as he blamed himself for not having dealt with Kelsey sooner. The news had gone viral on social media, and the entire city knew what had happened by then. Francis hadn't even had time to react before the information had spread like wildfire. Paul had gotten the news to Ian quickly, but he had still been too late. By then, the situation was out of hand. Silent tears streamed down Madison's face as she stayed curled up in her brother's arms. Ian was filled with regret. I should have been here. I should have asked her what was wrong and been more insistent. I should have done something to prevent this, he thought. He had known Madison was trying to work through something difficult, and he had considered pressing her about it. Instead, he had tried to give her space. But the situation had exploded on them. Madison's past had been made known to the public, and everyone had zeroed in on her. Even the Weston family was powerless to stop the media storm that was ensuing. Madison, Ian called softly, squatting down next to her and Zack. His warm palm gently rested on her shoulder. He felt her body stiffen for a moment, but he didn't take back his hand. Instead, he gently repeated, Madison... Finally, Madison lifted her head, and everything she had been suppressing burst out of her. Her teary eyes focused on her husband as she shouted, Do you see this? This is me. This is the real Madison. I was molested by a man 13 years ago. Now everyone thinks I'm tarnished and dirty. Do you think I'm dirty? Now everyone knows what happened. Even your family knows now. What will everyone think of me? She started sobbing again at that, and Zack pulled her back to hug her tightly. Her voice was muffled as she continued, Ian, I'm not fit to be a part of the Weston family. My past won't leave me alone. It wasn't easy for me to act normally around men all these years, but I can't take it anymore. I can't even be intimate with you. Everyone's waiting for me to give you a child, and I can't. I can't do it. She paused to let out a few sobs before she continued speaking. People have always said I'm cold and indifferent, and now you know why. I'm afraid to sleep with my husband. I can't even have a normal married life with you. Every word squeezed Ian's heart like a vice. Even after everything that had happened, it had never occurred to him that Madison had pushed him away out of fear. He opened his mouth, but he couldn't even speak. He had no idea what to do or how to help her. Madison, you don't have to say any more. That comforted her. If I want to say this, why shouldn't I? She asked, pulling back to look at her brother. There was no expression on her face, but her tears kept falling, and her eyes were puffy and bloodshot. If I don't say it now, I don't know that I ever will. 
Now that everyone knows about this, what can I do? No matter where I go, people will look down on me and they'll pity me. They're already judging me, so it doesn't matter what I say anymore. Both Zack and Ian furrowed their brows tightly in concern when she said that. Even though they wanted to protect her, it was unlikely her life would be peaceful for the foreseeable future. Ian, you told me before. You said you would take care of everything. You said you would protect me. But how can you protect me from this? She asked, looking him right in the eyes. This isn't fair for you either. Ever since we got married, you've been hurt again and again. Do you really think it's worth it being with me? Madison, he responded in a hoarse voice, but he didn't know what else to say. He desperately wanted to reassure her, but the right words just wouldn't come. A sad smile appeared on her face as she continued. After we got the certificate, every time I was hurt, you would appear. You always looked out for me. For a while, I really thought everything would be all right. Even if you weren't my lover, you could still be my family. But now, how can we possibly salvage this? His dark eyes stared straight at his wife, and he couldn't hide the guilt in them. You told me you would deal with the situation with Kelsey. Why didn't you? She asked softly. Ian stared at her helplessly, still unable to answer. Zack frowned and looked at his brother-in-law suspiciously. You know, this had nothing to do with you. But I'm still so angry at you, Madison said. Every time I look at you, I just feel waves of pain in my heart. You were going to handle Kelsey, but then you got busy. And you let Francis do it instead, right? That's why this happened, isn't it? He didn't deal with her in time, and she let everyone know what had happened to me. She hadn't run into Paul that morning. She wouldn't have known that Ian had been planning to solve the issue with Kelsey. She had been worried he would be too heavy-handed, but instead it had been the opposite. While she didn't say it out loud, she knew who had sent the message that had distracted Ian. She knew he had ignored the problem to deal with Claire instead. Ian furrowed his brows as he realized why she was upset. Zach was angry at the accusation and asked, Ian! Wife not as important as whatever else you were dealing with? Madison pulled away from her brother and came to her feet, with him following suit a moment later. She looked at him with sadness and affection as she said, Zach, not everyone treats me like a treasure the way you do. She had thought that one day she would be Ian's treasure, but now it seemed that she had been wrong. Clearly, she still wasn't as important to him as Claire. It had only taken one message from the ballerina for her husband to completely forget about her. Ian's heart sank when she said that. He had been trying to protect her, but he had failed. Shaking his head, he went to speak, but Zack cut him off. Madison, you should get a divorce, he stated. Startled, she turned to her brother, but he had no expression on his face. It was impossible to tell what he was thinking at that moment. Ian made a noise in protest, but before he could say anything, Zack spoke again. Madison, the Wuskin family will not accept you now, and I doubt Ian will accept you either. Even if they know you're the innocent victim, they won't accept something like this in their family. It would disrupt the image they've cultivated. He didn't realize that everything he said was an echo of what Madison had feared. Every time a scandal came up around her, she worried that the Westons would be done with her. Now she was afraid that this was just too much for them to accept. Even though she had feared Ian leaving her for different reasons, she never would have thought this would be what ended their relationship. Sou de cidade pequena. Mas sempre sonhei grande. De onde eu vim? Tudo parecia longe, mas isso não impediu meus vídeos de viajarem o mundo. Minha voz e meu cavaquinho encantaram muita gente, mas sabe o que me encanta de verdade? É transformar a vida de quem sempre esteve comigo. The vein in Ian's neck twitched. He glared at Zack his eyes burning with pure loathing. If I didn't know any better, 
I'd say that you have romantic feelings for your sister. There were so many things he had been wanting to get off his chest, and he had surprised himself in voicing them. But in his rage, he had completely forgotten to think of Madison's feelings. She gaped at Ian in disbelief. She felt as if she were looking at a stranger. Zack's expression barely changed, and he didn't refute Ian's words. Then, a loud slapping noise reverberated around the room, stunning both men. Ian held his hand to his cheek, absolutely dumbfounded. Did she really just hit me? Because of Zack? He wondered in disbelief. He struggled to recover from the blow. Ian, watch what you say and never insult my brother again. Madison's eyes were bright with rage. Her hands were clenched by her side. I don't care if it's Ian. No one is allowed to talk to my brother like that, she thought. Zack had shown her what love was. He had pulled her out of the nightmare that had been her life. He owed everything to him. Do you really think your brother treats you like his younger sister? Ian asked in a low growl. Are you blind to all of this? He's a man. How can he not have feelings for you? Zack's face had gone pale. His stomach flipped as if he were stuck on a roller coaster. His only consolation was that Madison had smacked Ian for him. It proved to him that he held a special place in her heart. Don't you dare project your own unclean thoughts onto my brother, Madison roared. Before Ian could say anything, she turned around and ushered Zack to the door. You head back first. I'll call you once I take care of this, she promised. She didn't want him to go through the pain of listening to her argument with Ian. Zack gazed into his sister's eyes and saw how serious she really was. He sucked in a deep breath to calm his nerves. He had to deal with the reporters. He had to do whatever he could to save Madison's reputation. It was best, he decided, to let her handle the conversation with Ian. Just after Zack left, Ian continued berating Madison. Are you kidding me? Can't you see that Zack likes you? Or are you hiding the truth from yourself? From the first time Ian met Zack, it was crystal clear to him that he had feelings for Madison. The way that he looked at her was more like a man watching a woman he liked than an older brother looking at his younger sister. Ian, stop, Madison commanded. She felt her body weaken, but she remained headstrong. He's my older half-brother. Stop conflating your own dirty thoughts with the way that Zack views me. Ian laughed. It was harsh and tinny, filled with cynicism. He had been aware of the fact that Zack held a special place in Madison's heart. What blindsided him was the extent of Zack's importance to her. I mean, she slapped me, for goodness sake, Ian thought incredulously. The more he thought about it, the more furious he became. It had been years since he had lost his temper so fully. He couldn't take it anymore. He reached out and grabbed Madison's wrist. His grip tightened as he loomed over her. When he spoke, his voice shook with rage. You had better hope that the situation with your brother is what you say it is. Otherwise, you'll regret this. Ian's sudden accents frightened Madison. She stood there in shock, and it took her a while to come back to her senses. When she finally did, she noticed the anger that colored her husband's face. But she was angry, too, and she was prepared to give him a piece of her mind. Do you really have such a narrow view of people that you think every man in this world is the same? That men and women can't have any kind of relationship other than romantic ones? I can't believe you could accuse Zack of something like this. You're crazy. Ian raised his head and sneered looking down at her. Crazy. Did she really just call me crazy? Trust me, you don't want to see me when I'm actually acting crazy, as you put it. He gnashed his teeth in anger. But I'll show you crazy if you want to see it. He seized Madison by the arms, gripping her tightly. She furiously pounded on his chest, trying to push him off of her. However, Ian was as immovable as a slab of concrete. But all his wrath soon dissipated. Madison had such a hold on him, 
and being close to her always made him melt. Without fully releasing her, he loosened his grip. He smiled into her beautiful face, but she didn't react. He couldn't bear to let go of the woman in his arms. Ever since he realized that he had fallen in love with her, his possessive qualities had begun to surface. For instance, when he had seen Zack holding her, he almost started a fight with him. Madison opened her eyes and looked at him. Not the slightest bit of emotion showed on her face. She didn't speak or make a fuss, and her arms fell powerlessly to her side. Her appearance alarmed Ian, and his heart skipped anxiously. Madison, he implored, his voice trembling and trailing off. Please, say something, anything. Ian hugged her, and then he led her over to the couch. He checked her arms to make sure that he hadn't bruised her. Talk to me, okay? Ian was growing confused. Don't be like this, he begged. Tears rolled down his cheeks. Still, she didn't say a word. She watched him cry with an impassive look on her face. But inside, she was in turmoil. He actually just grabbed me like that. How could he do something like that to me at a time like this? She wondered. Madison was filled with fear. But when she looked at Ian, the wrath inside her welled up again. She pushed him away and spoke harshly to him. Ian, I think it would be best if we didn't have anything to do with one another after this. We could go our separate ways. Her words scared Ian. She was clearly angry, but beneath the angry was a fragile expression. Ian, you're a... a beast, she cried. She had wanted to curse at him. But she knew that Ian was only feeling love for her at the moment. No man could be indifferent to a woman in his arms. Even Madison knew this. Still, he felt a chill run through her heart. Does Ian view me as his wife? Or as some random woman he could have a one-night stand with? She wondered in disgust. She sat on the couch dejectedly. Because of the incident with the reporters, the relations between Zack and her family would grow increasingly more chaotic. Now, before I even had a chance to organize my thoughts, I got into another argument with Ian, she thought desperately. She regarded her husband with an injured expression. The look on her face pained Ian. It felt like a knife was plunging into him. His throat tightened, and then his eyes fell on the coat that Zack had left behind. He moved it to the side and pulled the curtain shut, enveloping Madison in the safety of the room. He held her tightly in his arms. I'm so sorry, Madison. I didn't mean to speak to you like that, he whispered in her ear. The honest regret in his words and tone was obvious. This calmed her a bit. Her crying was no longer as desperate as before. A low cry emerged from her throat and broke the emotional barrier in Madison's heart. All the helplessness she felt poured out of her. Ian, how could you do this to me? She couldn't wrap her head around his actions. After discovering that she had been entangled in an unfair scandal, not only had he neglected to comfort her, but he also accused her favorite brother of having romantic feelings for her. Ian put his mouth close to her ear. He whispered heartfelt apologies to her over and over again. Madison buried her head in his arms and cried. She let out all the emotions she had been holding back for days. The sound of her sobbing pulled at Ian's heartstrings. At the same time, it incited his anger again. Everyone who hurt Madison today needs to pay the price for what they did, he thought. Chaos surrounded Madison's home. Ian had no choice but to retreat with her to the bedroom. He quickly called Francis and asked him to get people from the Pink Star Hotel to clean up the scene. As requested, Francis immediately ordered two cleaners to go to the apartment. Of course, neither of them could stop themselves from snooping. While they were folding and putting away Madison's clothes, they peeked into the bedroom. They saw her in there, holding a tablet. He swiped the screen every so often, scrolling through new posts, headlines, and tabloid articles. The unknown path of Miss Madison Greenwald. Is Madison innocent, or was this an elaborate ploy to marry above her class? 
Will Ian Lefton soon be single? Did Madison Greenwald behave badly? She was the subject of seemingly every headline. Her name was already the top trending search term online. Then, she unexpectedly stumbled upon a video. She scrutinized the scenery in the first frame before hitting play, and her heart skipped a beat. She knew the location like the back of her hand. It was a hallway in her family's home from 13 years ago. Madison recalled that multiple security cameras had been installed in the house. It was the reason why they'd been able to find video footage of the person entering her room. She inhaled heavily, her breath coming in increasingly frantic gulps of air. Her fingers trembled slightly, hovering over the keyboard. She debated whether she should tap into the video or not. When Ian came in holding a glass of milk, he saw Madison sitting there like that, quivering and fearful. He sat down the glass and sat beside her. He reached out and rested his hand on her shoulder, silently comforting her. He hadn't had time to watch the video circulating online before getting swept up in the events of the day. He had only known that some light gossip was going on around on the internet, but it seemed that the situation had increased in severity. Madison inhaled sharply, and then she took a deep, steadying breath. She pressed play. It was too late for her to continue hiding from the situation. Everywhere she turned, there it was. People were waiting to see how she would deal with everything. Whether for the Weston family or herself, she had to take the matter seriously. Thirteen years ago, there had only been dim lights lining the hallways of the Greenwald family mansion. The display indicated that Zack had carried Madison into the room at ten o'clock in the evening. Her clothes were soaking wet, and she seemed to have fainted. Immediately after that, the Greenwald family doctor rushed over and left half an hour later. After that, all the people who had entered Madison's bedroom left, leaving her alone. At two o'clock in the morning, a black shadow appeared in the video. It appeared to be a male figure wearing a baseball cap and black clothes. He walked straight into Madison's room. Half an hour later, Zack came out of his bedroom with a glass of water to check on her. Then, there was a silence that lasted for less than a minute. After that, Madison watched Zack grab the black shadow on the screen just as he was about to rush out. It was difficult to make out what had happened but Zack was definitely lying on the ground and grabbing the intruder's foot. Anyone who observed closely enough would be able to see that a pool of blood was blooming under Zack's body. He shouted at the top of his lungs for help. However, for some reason, it took an entire minute for someone to come out. By that time, the black shadow had already disappeared. Madison's body became increasingly tense as the video went on. Her breathing was ragged and uneven. Ian reached out and patted her back to help her breathe. At the same time, he whispered something into her ear, trying his best to pull her back from her dark thoughts. The next visible shot of footage revealed that Madison's clothes had been strewn about. In the video, she was rushing out of the room, passing by Zack in the process. Out of her entire family, only John had ended up going to the room to see what was going on. He picked up Zack in his arms and left quickly. The scene ended there. The milk part of the video had been too dark to see, so it was up to the viewer's imagination to fill in the blanks. And because Madison, only ten years old, appeared to be so distressed in the video, people began to speculate. The general public had quickly fallen into a heated discussion about what had happened. Madison's hands began to tremble, and the tablet shook in her tight grasp. Her face was pale and colorless, and she was nearly hyperventilating. Ian watched her attentively, afraid that she was about to have a panic attack. Madison, he cooed softly. He picked up the tablet and tossed it to the side. Then he pulled her into his arms and held her. That was thirteen years ago. You're fine now. You're safe. Madison's body was still quivering, but her breathing had slowed a little. You're safe now. I'm by your side, Ian said. He gently rubbed her back with his warm palm and whispered to her, I'm by your side, he repeated. From today onward, nothing like that will ever happen to you again. Trust me, you're safe. 
He repeated this to her more times than he could count. Madison's breathing gradually steadied. Ian only let go of her when her body was still. He gazed straight into her eyes and reassured her. Listen, everything is in the past. We're together now, and no matter what happens, I will be by your side. As Madison looked up at him, a warm feeling flowed through her. Ian's words had surged into her world, flooding it with warmth. His voice, like magic, had calmed her down. Even just a word of comfort from him had been enough for her. Raising her voice to his, she laced her fingers behind his neck. Two tears rolled down her face. Ian, thank you, she whispered. Ian breathed a sigh of relief and smiled. Then he heard her say, May I tell you a secret? A secret about me. Subconsciously, Ian knew that whatever Madison said next would have nothing to do with the event they just watched on the screen. Thirteen years ago, she began, I was ten years old. That night, the one from the video, I searched for Zack at the swimming pool, but he wasn't there. I fell into the water by accident. To make matters worse, I'm the only person in my family who can't swim. At the time, there was no one in the swimming pool area. So I fell in the water until my brother finally came out and found me. Only then did he realize that I was drowning. After he rescued me, he couldn't carry me. He went to find my other half-brother to help lift me. After he rescued me, I developed a fever. Madison paused, her thoughts involuntarily returning to the night in question. Thirteen years ago, her family had been growing very wealthy. But her father's business had still relied heavily on outside help. If not for paying off people for their help, her family might have ended up as rich as the Crawfords. Madison took a deep breath and continued. So I was resting on my bed recovering. Zach stayed by my side until my father ordered him to go to bed. Before leaving, he promised to visit me in the middle of the night and bring me a glass of water. Madison smiled. Softly, she confessed. If my brother hadn't gone to visit me, I don't know what would have happened to me. As she pondered it, the matter gradually became clear to her. Still, ran up her spine. She grasped Ian's hand in both of hers and cried, I don't know what time it was. I only know that when I was in a feverish days, a pair of exceptionally warm hands suddenly crossed my face. Then they moved to my arm. Madison couldn't go on. Her breath hit. Every time she thought about it, she felt an overwhelming sense of hopelessness. She couldn't stop it. She glanced at the door, just outside. Some, likely, many people would try to ridicule her for the rest of her life. After all, since the reporters had tried to humiliate her once, it wasn't difficult to imagine that they would do it again. Madison shored herself up and resumed her story. There was no light in the room. I had seen the man by the moonlight coming in through the window. He clearly knew that I was awake, but he still went over to touch me. I was terrified, afraid of what he might do next. Madison broke down into shaking sobs for a minute. Once she had calmed slightly, she continued. I watched him. I wanted to call someone, but I couldn't. I wanted to cry, but I couldn't. I felt frozen. When his hand touched my leg, I wanted to scream, to beg him to leave me alone. But never once did he look into my eyes. I could feel him staring at me, though. Then I saw his sadistic gaze. My entire body felt cold. I opened my mouth to cry out, but no sound came out. I was too powerless to struggle. At that moment, I felt like I was about to die. That or go crazy. Even though she wasn't her biological mother, Stella had at least taken the reins on explaining matters of intimacy to Madison. Because of that, she had understood at that time, at least vaguely, that this man was displaying very intimate behavior. However, she didn't think to call it molestation until she was older. I stared at him without blinking, hoping that my gaze would make him stop. Madison's eyes widened slightly. In a shaky voice, he went on. But when he finally looked at me, I wished I had never seen him. She couldn't hold back her tears, and she was overcome again by heaving sobs. Her hands gripped the sides of her head, she didn't want to think about it anymore. Watching her, Ian's heart ached. It was hard for him to imagine just how terrifying it would be for a ten-year-old girl to experience such a thing. He didn't press her for information. 
Rather, he quietly comforted her in his way, rubbing her back. Madison closed her eyes and shook her head. The horrified look on her face incited Ian's anger. He wanted to find the person who had hurt her and beat him to a pulp. Please don't look at me, Madison begged. I can't bear it. Ian hugged her even more tightly, trying to bring her back to him. It was clear this incident had a deep impact on her. She was still haunted by it even 13 years after it had happened. Ian considered telling her not to think about it. But before he could get a word out, she reached out and gripped his shirt in both hands. Ian, she said in wide-eyed horror. He's smiling at me. He's smiling at me. A chill ran through Ian's body. Against her will, a flashback was putting Madison right back in that memory. She felt like she was lying in her old bed. In the darkness, she spotted the man in the baseball cap. He smiled strangely at her in the moonlight, and in the depths of his shimmering eyes, she detected a touch of joy. She could only look at the man in horror. There was no chance of fighting him off. Madison completely broke down. The strange smile on the man's face was a shadow that had followed her during her entire life. She couldn't keep it inside any longer. Ian, he's smiling at me, and he's laughing about what he's doing. She had never told anyone about the assault. In fact, this was the first time she'd ever spoken about it at all. Madison, Ian called. Don't think about it anymore. It's over, and it will never happen again. But she was possessed by fear. She cried and repeated that one phrase over and over again. He's smiling at me. He's smiling at me. Ian was distressed. If he had known about the attack, he would have comforted her and helped her to put it all behind her. It was clear that many years of hard work had allowed her to interact with men normally. But because of his impatience and the coercion coming from the rest of the Weston family... All of these memories had risen to the surface again. And when Stella had tried to force her to be with Drake, Ian couldn't even imagine how triggering that must have been. On Madison's end, it was somewhat of a relief to tell her story to another person. At the same time, reliving it all over again through flashbacks had been painful. She could handle a man confessing his love to her, and she could also face a man trying to coerce her. But what had happened in her room that night was something else entirely. When Drake had forced himself on her, she had resisted him with all her might. But that man in her room had rendered her immobile with fear. She had felt as helpless as an animal on the chopping block. Retelling her story to Ian made her feel powerless all over again. Ian could only hug her tightly. He allowed her to cry out everything she was feeling. Madison had encountered so many terrible things before meeting him. In his opinion, this experience was the saddest one of all. The best way to handle difficult situations is to face them directly, he thought. He had always believed this to be true. Even though he felt uncomfortable, he wanted to support her. He asked her softly, What happened after that? Is that when Zach went to your room? His question was a welcome distraction from the vision of that sadistic smile. Madison adjusted her breathing slightly. Yes. Soon after, Zach came with the water. The moment he entered the room, he rushed toward the man. But it was no use. The guy pulled out a small knife. I tried frantically to get up, but there was nothing I could do, she exclaimed. Madison swallowed hard before continuing. He stopped what he was doing and he flashed at me fiercely. I remember the sharpness of that cold and shiny blade. He raised it up, and just as he was about to stab me in the chest, my brother jumped between us. He had been willing to bear that blow for me. The man ended up stabbing my brother in the back. I remember the air smelling like blood. Ian had an agonized look on his face. Only now did he understand why Madison was so dependent on Zack. He had saved her, swooping in like a superhero. 
whereas the rest of the Greenwald family members were cold and indifferent. He had sacrificed his life to protect Madison. Ian calculated that Zack would have been 17 years old at the time. In the prime of his adolescence, his social status was high enough that he could have enjoyed a carefree life of luxury and wealth. But he had remained his sister's protector, always there for her. Ian wrapped Madison up more tightly in his arms. He regretted having voiced his negative feelings about her and Zack's relationship. No matter how I feel about it, it's not my place to insert myself into the matter. That was so insulting of me, Ian thought, kicking himself. Zack's back had been injured ever since that stabbing, but he still protects me. He smiles at me and tries to make me laugh just to make me feel better, Madison said. Her eyes were filled with a tenderness that spoke volumes about her love for her brother. After he was wounded, she proceeded. The two of them fought. They made a lot of noise and many things were broken in the process. But still, no one else in my family came to see what was going on. That man was obviously much stronger than my brother. And because of his injury, Zack was at a great disadvantage. By the time I finally pulled myself into a sitting position on the bed, my brother had already collapsed. He was sprawled out on the ground, trying his best to grab the man's pant leg. Madison might not understand Zack's motivations for saving her, but Ian thought he understood. He had likely intuited that her assaults would leave her with a lifelong trauma and a fear of being attacked again. He had probably guessed that the best way to protect her would be to bring the man to justice right in front of her. He had likely wanted to capture the man and prove to Madison that she would be safe from future attacks. But Zack, in his injured state, had failed to do that. Madison finished explaining the situation to Ian. After seeing her brother on the ground, she looked blankly around the dark bedroom. Her brother had been breathing weakly. Then, the sound of footsteps coming from the hallway startled her. She had rushed out of her room barefooted, in fear. Before she left, she had heard Zack telling Alex to follow her and to keep her safe. Madison suddenly whispered, Ian... My brother gave me a second chance at life. If it hadn't been for Zack, she might have died that night, or she might have fallen into lifelong despair. After a few seconds of silence, Ian murmured, I'm sorry I was narrow-minded. I'll apologize to him. And he would apologize, not because he thought he was in the wrong, but because he had upset Madison in dragging her brother through the dirt. In fact, after hearing the story... He was even more suspicious of Zack's feelings. Zack's terrorism in saving his sister gave Ian pause. Perhaps his feelings for her could be traced back to her childhood. This made Ian feel a little nervous for some reason. Even though he knew that they were siblings, he also knew that feelings couldn't always be helped. Madison smiled and sighed lightly. She closed her eyes, feeling like a weight had been lifted from her. From where the two of them were sitting... Everything seemed peaceful. With the help of professional cleaners, the house was soon restored to its original state. However, Francis couldn't help but take a deep breath. When Paul came over with brand new furniture, the two men exchanged a look. After the events of the day, everything changed. As gossip spread, everyone in Madison's network became affected. Ian's plans to go to Japan had to be suspended so that he could take charge of the Weston family. On Cassandra's side, customers called in every minute to ask about the truth of the matter. Even Kelsey, who had initially released the news, found herself surrounded by reporters. How's the situation outside? Francis asked Paul in a low voice, his face full of worry. Paul shook his head. He couldn't bear to talk about the public reactions. On the internet alone, Madison was being mocked and demeaned. Every word posted about her was like salt being rubbed into her wounds. Before Paul and Francis could say anything, Ian padded out of the bedroom. He turned around and sat on the couch. 
the Queen Earth departed, leaving only the three of them in the living room. Paul closed the door. Mr. Weston, we've investigated what you asked us to, Francis announced. Ian interrupted him before he had a chance to report the findings. Let's postpone this discussion for now. Paul, tell me about the situation outside. He regretted ordering Francis to look into other matters that morning. Francis stood aside quietly. He used his tablet to answer messages here and there. Paul frowned and said, It's chaos outside. The Weston family, the Greenwald family, and the Morris family have all been affected. There are even some reporters who found out that Madison worked at Green. So now people are waiting there as well for some news. Even L. Thompson is getting asked her opinion. Everyone has different views. Some say good things and some say bad things. With every word that he heard, Ian's frown deepened. His eyes were narrowed, and his hands were clenched into tight fists. After a long while, Ian spoke. Send someone to bring Allie over to be with Madison. Bring Cassandra over as well, and you two, come with me for a while. Francis and Paul carried out his orders. Twenty minutes later, Allie and Cassandra showed up. There was no need to give them instructions. They each knew what they had to do. You can go, Cassandra assured Ian. With me here, nothing will happen. Ian was still so worried about Madison that it was written all over his face. Allie couldn't help but glance over at him in concern, and they both tried to ease his anxiety. Allie and Cassandra each knew Madison well enough to confidently handle the situation. One of them would ensure that she felt calm and safe, and the other would block anyone from the outside who tried to barge in. Ian left Allie and Cassandra to it. He had his next move on his mind. He was going to handle the situation as a husband should. Trailing behind him, Paul and Francis watched his back. They noticed the way that his muscles tensed as he walked. They immediately had a feeling that a storm was coming. It was clear from his body language that Ian was furious. Meanwhile, countless reporters gathered at the entrance to the Morris family's home. Dozens of cameras were aimed at the front door. Autumn leaves fell through the air and landed softly on the ground. But given the hordes of people outside, they were all stepped on and crushed into pieces. Emmett sat at home feeling ambivalent. Did he prove of Kelsey's behavior or not? When he found out that Kelsey had miscarried, he had been so angry that he almost cursed Madison at the Morris Corporation meeting. So when Kelsey had expressed that she wanted to take revenge on Madison... He didn't try to stop her. He never would have thought that Kelsey's actions would cause such a fuss. She had behaved impulsively, and had handled the situation badly. Emmett had never doubted Kelsey until then. Still, he felt a little bad for her. She had just lost her child, and her body was still recovering. Her face was so pale that it was scary. However, no one in the Morris family was showing her any kindness or concern. Just a few days before, when she was still pregnant, the Morrises had treated her like a princess. After she had lost the baby, they completely abandoned her. Kelsey was sitting alone in her bedroom, watching the autumn wind stir up leaves outside the window. She couldn't help but sneer. Madison, if I can't have a good life, you may as well join me, she thought viciously. The most detestable thing to Kelsey was that Madison had lied to her. If she hadn't lied by telling her that she was pregnant, it never would have come to all this. Chelsea couldn't think about it anymore. Stella, meanwhile, finally broke through the crowd outside and opened the front door to find a group of people chatting in the living room. She looked around for Kelsey, but she was nowhere to be seen. Stella was of two minds on the matter of her daughter. She loved her dearly, but Kelsey had gone too far this time. Stella was at a loss for what to do. Even if I wanted to help her, there's nothing I could say, she thought. After she had closed the front door, she went into the Morris' kitchen and found some soup, which she heated and put on a tray. Her heart ached with concern for her daughter. After all, she was still so young, and she had just miscarried. This was undoubtedly a difficult moment for her. She walked up to her bedroom. Kelsey, are you experiencing any discomfort? If so, you have to tell me. Don't hold it in. Stella implored when she stepped in 
and ladled some soup for her daughter. You're still so young. If a fetus doesn't make it, so be it. Take care of your body first so that you'll be able to give birth in the future. When the time is right, you and Luke will start a family. Chelsea grimaced at Stella's words. Instead of accepting the soup when her mother offered it to her, she knocked it out of her hands and onto the ground. She sat up straight and hissed. What do you know? If you had figured out that Madison wasn't actually pregnant, do you think I would be in this position right now? I lost a child because I wanted to get rid of her child. Madison was not destined to be with the Westons. And there, I saw an opening for me. But I failed, and it's all your fault. The main problem isn't that you didn't figure out the truth. Your real mistake was that you didn't beat her to prevent her from getting pregnant in the future. Stella was shocked by Kelsey's words, which made her deeply uncomfortable, and she turned her head toward the bedroom door to check that it was closed. But it had opened a crack without her noticing. She would have been horrified to know that Luke was standing outside and could hear what Kelsey was saying. Kelsey shouted at her mother. I'm sure you know that even if Madison hadn't been pregnant, you could have taken matters into your own hands. Even just a few kicks would have helped lower the chances of future pregnancies. But you couldn't even gather up the courage to do that. Why are you so useless? Tears danced in Stella's eyes. But no matter how Kelsey treated her, she was still her daughter. She had doted on her all her life, and Kelsey's current anger wouldn't change how she felt. Picking up the bowl that had dropped on the carpet, Stella suppressed the bitterness in her heart. She ladled out more soup for her. Yes, it was all because your mother is useless. But there's no need to get worked up about it. It's wrapped up first, okay? No matter how angry you are, remember that you're still recuperating right now. As for your plans with Ian, I will help you with whatever plan you come up with next. Right now... I only want you to take care of your health. Kelsey rolled her eyes, but she definitely felt calmer than she had before, even though her jaw was still tightly clenched. Stella carefully carried the new bowl of soup over, and Kelsey reluctantly ate a few spoonfuls. Just as she finished, she asked, Are there a lot of reporters outside? Stella nodded and looked up to see Kelsey smiling strangely, as if she was planning something. Back in the living room, Luke clenched his fist to suppress the rage in his heart. Chelsea killed our child, almost with her own hands, and all for Ian Weston. He screamed in his mind. The fetus was only three months old. How could she be so hateful? Didn't that personally heard Chelsea admit to this just a moment ago? He would have assumed that she had been the victim. Luke's sister Lynn, who was sitting next to her mother, had been in a bad mood all day. But when she'd heard the news about Madison's latest scandal, her mood had brightened. She lifted her head when Stella and Kelsey came in. Stella was still consoling her daughter. Zoe put down the teacup she had been holding. Why did you come down? She asked Kelsey. You should rest in bed after what you've been through. Walking around like this could hurt you. Although Luke's mother sounded concerned, she didn't make any move to leave her spot. Stella couldn't help but feel angry when she saw this. Zoe, she proclaimed, my Kelsey has always been very careful about the way she handles being a part of your family. Since suffering a miscarriage, she's been worried that a large number of reporters at the door might put the Morris Corporation at risk. She came down out of concern. Can you not see that? Zoe scoffed at Stella. It had been many years since anyone had dared to insult her family. Here I was thinking that the Greenwalds would be respectful and not let their emotions get the best of them. Well, I'll just say this. It's not the Morris family you should be concerned about, she sat. Well, Stella shot back, my son would never allow his sister to get hurt like this. But it seems like your son is a different story. Stella had bitten down heavily on the words, my son. Sure enough, Zoe and Emmett's expression shifted. To outsiders, Zack was definitely the most well-known figure in the Greenwald family. Zoe shot Lynn and Luke a glance. Lynn unwillingly got up and walked over to help Kelsey. Luke also stood up and followed behind her. Stella's face had calmed somewhat. Zoe spoke to Stella standoffishly. 
If you really think that we don't care about Kelsey, go out and take care of all of this right now. And we really should be cooking better food for Kelsey to eat. Otherwise, she'll be giving birth to babies as thin as sticks. Stella supported Kelsey as she walked toward the door. The reporters, who had been staring dejectedly at the entrance to the Morris's house, perked up when they saw someone coming. They immediately shouted questions at Kelsey. Mrs. Morris, may I ask you why you wanted to release that video? Do you and your older sister have a bad relationship? Are you going to take action against Madison for your miscarriage? Questions were rattled off one after another, causing Lynn to scowl. Isn't all this scandal tarnishing my family's reputation? She wondered. Kelsey, however, wore a calm, slightly melancholy expression. This made people curious. They whispered among themselves, wondering what she would say and how she would explain her actions. Luke glared at the scene. The corners of his mouth raised in ridicule, but he didn't say anything. Luke had to admire Kelsey's acting abilities. Standing in front of the crowd wearing simple house clothes, her face was pale. She looked weak, the way any woman would after such an ordeal. It appeared as though she would fall to the ground if Stella and Lynn weren't there to support her. When a gust of chilly autumn wind came, Luke took off his coat and placed it around Kelsey's shoulders. He looked like a good husband. The reporters pounced on him with their questions. Mr. Morris, do you know about the video that your wife posted on the internet? A reporter asked. Mr. Morris, what do you think of your wife's actions toward your ex-girlfriend? Another one inquired. Mr. Morris, how does your family feel about losing a future heir? A third one interjected. Luke didn't answer a single question. He simply looked at Kelsey gently, as if she were the only person in the world. Kelsey couldn't meet his gaze. She was haunted by the thought that just a moment ago, Luke had been looking at her with hatred. But when she finally lifted her gaze, she saw only love. I've been mistaken, she wondered in relief. Stella lightly pinched her, bringing her back to the moment. Kelsey put on an even more miserable look and addressed the crowd. Everyone, I came out today to explain things. Between my sister and I, one of us is married into the Morris family. The other married into the Weston family. Rest assured this hasn't affected our relationship. I've loved Madison since we were children. Unfortunately, because of my sister's mistake, I lost the child I was pregnant with. But I don't hate her for it, really. I've forgiven her. Kelsey bit her lips. He knew that she played the part of the good younger sister convincingly. However, there was a clear motive behind her words. First of all, Kelsey hadn't explained their relationship very clearly. She had only emphasized that she liked her sister very much. And in saying that Madison was the reason she had miscarried, Kelsey had implied that she had committed a crime. It didn't matter that she claimed she had forgiven her. Her seemingly simple speech revealed so much. It was impossible for the reporters not to run with it. She took a deep breath before making another statement. The video incident posted to the internet was a total mistake. I'd been sorting through files on my computer when I found the video. I had originally wanted to delete it. However, my fingers slipped on the keyboard, and I accidentally uploaded it. That's the only reason why the video was posted online. I've already ordered it for it to be taken down. I hope that no one will make things difficult for my sister because of this. Kelsey knew that she had to implicate herself in some way. Otherwise, her story wouldn't be convincing enough. I admit that when Madison married into the Weston family, I was very surprised. Especially since it was her. When Brooklyn reported that she... Suddenly, Kelsey stopped talking. She gazed out into the crowd in panic. Her eyes darted back and forth. The reporters were waiting for her to continue. They weren't about to let her go that easily. Mrs. Morris, what do you mean by that? Are you hinting that Miss Greenwald made a false report about something? Be the truth of what happened back then. Can you tell me? Then the reporters rushed forward. The Morris family's houseworkers all tried to stop them, but they were powerless against the crowd. 
Kelsey was shocked by her slip of the tongue. She subconsciously turned her head to look at her mother. Immediately, the reporters turned their attention to her. Mrs. Morris, may I ask exactly what happened? Can you tell me? Mrs. Morris was Madison innocent when she married into the Weston family. Mrs. Morris, may I ask what that person did to Madison Greenwald in the room? Can you describe it? All the questions were directed at Kelsey. She looked at her mother worriedly and, without thinking, leaned against Luke for comfort. He glanced down at her, a touch of ridicule dancing in his eyes. He had not realized what a vicious woman Kelsey was. It seemed that for wealth and fame, she would push down whomever she needed to. Stella looked at the reporter in front of her. She was in a difficult position. Finally, she gave an answer. What happened back then is in the past now. I'm sure you've watched the video. Think what you will of it. I'm not saying anything more. The reporters only became more insistent. Camera flashes popped in front of them like strobe lights and questions were flung at them left and right. Do you know that it's a crime to lie about things like this? A voice boomed out. Throngs of people whipped around to find the owner of the voice. Then Ian took a step forward. The reporters gripped their notebooks and their microphones prepared to ask them questions. He waved his hands, signaling them to hold off. Before you ask me anything, you'd better make sure that what you've just heard is the truth. Otherwise, your reports will be false. You could all destroy your reputations. Ian shot an icy look at Stella and Kelsey. These two people made Madison suffer so much. They're the ones who brought this heartache on her, he thought, grimacing. The reporters looked at each other. Then they all turned back to Ian and blasted him with questions. Mr. Weston, may I ask your opinion on the video? Mr. Weston... May I ask what your wife said about this matter? May I ask what your family's opinions on all this is? Is there any chance you'll get a divorce? The questions seemed to become much gentler than before. However, when it came to the topic of marriage and divorce, Kelsey couldn't help but shift nervously. Luke, noticing this, sneered. What a scheming, opportunistic woman she is, Luke thought coldly. When Kelsey found out that Madison was engaged to Luke, she had done everything in her power to take him from her. And now that she knew who Ian was, she was doing whatever she could to destroy their marriage. Ian didn't answer the reporters. He merely stared into Kelsey's eyes and said, Mrs. Morris, I think we need to settle matters between us. As soon as he finished speaking, the crowd fell silent. The release of the video. You said that it was an accident and I will take your word for it. However, do you think I should deal with the matter of you publicly slandering my wife at the Palace Arcade Shopping Center? Kelsey, your words are ambiguous, which only ever makes matters worse. As for the reporters present, I'm sure you can guess how many of them trespass on my private property today. You should be receiving a letter from my lawyers tomorrow about that. Then, Ian glanced at the people present and spoke in an icy tone. And if you don't leave here, then I am prepared to take further legal action against you. If I hadn't been married to Madison, if she didn't carry my family name, the press wouldn't have made such a big deal of all that, he thought restlessly. It seemed to him that his identity only brought harm to the people he loved. The very reason why his wife had suffered all of this public humiliation was that he, Ian, was a Weston. As soon as Ian finished speaking... The street became so silent that you could almost hear the sound of cricket. Kelsey's eyes shined with a fiery light as she looked at him. She interpreted Ian scolding the reporters as a kind of protection. How could this be anything other than a kind of happiness? She thought. Her thought process was often nearly impossible to follow. A reporter came back to his senses and asked Ian, Mr. Weston, what do you plan to do? After that first question... A large number of people rushed forward. Mr. Weston, are you planning to deal with them through your business rivalry? Are you still going to keep in contact with Miss Greenwald's family? Mr. Weston, did you tacitly approve of the video being released? Tell us, has Miss Greenwald always been untrustworthy and unfaithful? After that final question, the entire crowd fell silent. 
Many veteran newscasters and journalists turned their heads to look at the young reporter who had formulated it. They were shocked by his boldness. Ian searched the crowd to find the man who had asked the question. Pinpointing him, Ian shouted, Remember that question. You will receive a letter from my lawyers tomorrow. The reporter's face turned chalky. In a hesitant voice, he said, Mr. Weston, I'm only asking. Only asking. Before our wedding ceremony, my wife underwent an examination that no woman should ever have to go through, particularly in this day and age. The only reason she did it was to put down the rumors that people like you had been fanning. The results, that she was a virgin, were made public. Maybe even some of you were present. So first of all, I can't believe you would ask such a question. Second of all, you have questioned my wife's honesty and that of the doctors who issued the report. Third of all, you have insulted my wife and her intelligence. Even though he spoke calmly, everyone around Ian took a step back. Ian's icy glare seemed to hold the young journalist in place. My wife is no fool, he said. I know who she is. You, however, do not. What gives you the right to stand there and cast doubt on her character? Why do you feel the need to tarnish her reputation? If this is your idea of news, you should consider a different line of work. He looked at the assembled press, making sure they knew he was talking to all of them. One or two found themselves unable to meet his eyes. Every journalist knows that they must strive for objectivity. Otherwise, they're just sharing gossip. Once rumor takes the place of fact, the whole thing falls apart. The luckless reporter trembled, too frightened to speak. A photographer took pity on him and nudged him toward the back of the crowd where he could hide. Ian swept his gaze over the reporters again. But don't let me stand in the way of your principles. If you stand by your story, then you should no qualms about facing what I'm capable of. I look forward to seeing what happens next. He turned and walked back to his car where Francis and Paul had been waiting, watching the scene unfold. As they climbed into the vehicle, Paul sneered at Kelsey. He knew that there were people in the world who only seemed to thrive when they were making trouble. All you do is throw gasoline on the fire without caring who gets burned, he thought. Still worried about Madison, Ian got home as quickly as he could. When he stepped into the apartment, he could hear voices from the kitchen. Without meaning to, he hurried toward them. Cassandra and Allie let out twin sighs of relief at the sight of him. Madison had been fighting to keep her emotions in check, and it was starting to wear on her. She was struggling to find anything else to think about, anything else to talk about, that didn't involve the scandal. The three of them had been making dinner when he arrived, and Cassandra watched Madison go still when she saw him. Catching Allie's eye, she nodded toward the door. Let's give them a little privacy, she said, wafting her hands. She needs them more than she needs us, she thought. As Allie and her sister gathered their things and left, Ian rolled up his sleeves. What are we making? he asked lightly, as if nothing were amiss. The smallest smile bloomed on Madison's face. Some strip steaks are marinating on the counter, she said. Sound good? He smiled and nodded, picking up the chef's knife Allie had been using, and started chopping carrots. For a few moments, the air in the kitchen was light and carefree. They playfully tossed slices of vegetables into each other's mouths and teased each other when they missed. Madison made him laugh by pretending to be grumpy when a bit of celery bounced off her nose. They dragged out their time in the kitchen for as long as they could. When dinner was ready, they smiled at each other. He reached around her and untied her apron, guiding her toward the dinner table. Your table is ready, madame, he said in an exaggerated French accent. He pulled her chair out for her and theatrically draped a napkin across her lap before hurrying back to the kitchen for a bottle of wine. She looked at the food laid out on the table. Perfect. It looks perfect. I wish it could always be like this, she mused. He poured them both a glass of wine and held them up. A toast. He was cut off by a frantic knocking at the door. With a frown, Ian put down his glass and went to answer it with Madison close behind him. The knocking became pounding before they reached the door. 
He stopped short and turned to take her hand. I need you to trust me, he told her. She nodded, her heart in her throat. It was Paul, breathless as if he had run to their building. Oh, Diana, she's collapsed. She's being flown to a clinic out of state. Your parents sent me to get you because your phone's off and the chopper can't wait forever. Madison felt Ian's hand tighten on hers, almost crushing it. She winced, but she didn't say anything or pull away. We have to go, Paul urged. He was trying to stay calm, but his anxiety was palpable. We'll grab our coats, Ian said, turning toward the hall closet. Paul cleared his throat and put his hand on Ian's arm, holding him in place. Just you, Ian. I'm only here to collect you. He looked at their clasped hands. Diana doesn't want Madison to come. Madison's knees weakened and the breath rushed out of her lungs. Ian stared at Paul's hand on his arm in shock, and a heavy silence fell. Paul couldn't bring himself to look at her. Miserably, he soldiered on. We have to go, he repeated. She needs you now. Ian glared at him for a full minute before bringing Madison's hands to his lips. Wait for me, he told her. She forced herself to smile and nodded. He let go of her hand, and she felt like a piece of her heart was being torn away at the same time. She stood in the doorway until the elevator doors closed, clenching her jaw to keep herself from crying. Of course he has to go to her. Their family, she thought, tears sliding down her cheeks. Her being there would just complicate things, and the press was relentless. Letting him go was the only reasonable thing to do. But for a moment, she had not felt like being reasonable. Letting go of his hands had hurt. The empty apartment was full of rich aromas of the dinner they just made together, which sat on the table untouched. Madison stared at the food and the wine, and realized that she had never felt more alone than at that moment. No Greenwald, no Weston, no Ian. Nothing solid for me to hold on to, she thought. The news about the Westons leaving town had spread quickly, and not half an hour had passed since Ian left before reporters started gathering on the street in front of the building. Without turning on the lights, she glumly pulled the curtains shut and sat on the couch, wrapping herself in a blanket. Reluctantly, she pulled her phone from her pocket and turned it on. It had been off to avoid the incessant texts and calls from reporters, but she didn't want to miss a call from Ian. As if lying in wait, Stella's name and number flashed on the screen with a harsh buzz. Madison considered letting it go to voicemail, but answered despite herself. Don't forget that you waived all claims to your father's money and property when you got married. Stella crowed without waiting for her to speak. We have your signature to that effect. That includes anything you might try to weasel out of your brother. You wanted out of this family, and that's what you got. I know you have Zach running around to help you. But if you care about him at all, you'll stop using him like some kind of servant. That's all you do, Madison. You use people like you use Ian to make trouble for Kelsey. Stella went on at some length, cursing and scolding with more venom than ever. Madison sat stonely and said nothing, letting Stella shout herself forth. Very slowly, anger began to churn in her stomach until it seemed to spill through her body to fill the room. Eventually, she wasn't even sure what she was most angry about. Ian leaving her alone, Diana not wanting to see her, the Westons cutting her off, or her own family not caring whether she lived or died. It all blurred together in a flurry of resentment and hurt. The only person I can count on is me, she mused bitterly. Dimly aware that Stella's voice was still shrinking from the phone, she ended the call and walked over to the open windows. Looking out at the growing crowd of reporters, she struggled to find a way to turn her situation around on her own. There was a part of her that was tempted to go outside and talk to the press, but that had been a mistake the first time, and she couldn't afford to make it again. For hours she stood there, clutching her phone and waiting for Ian's call while ignoring everyone else's. When she became too tired to stand, she sat at the windowsill, letting the chill and the damp sink into her skin, hoping to feel as miserable on the outside as she did on the inside. The insistent chiming of the doorbell woke her up in the morning, 
Feverish and weak, she staggered to the door. Allie and Jason had fought their way through the press downstairs and were about ready to kick down the door when it opened. Madison stared at them, blinking in the sunshine. Her throat felt like it was lined with shards of glass. Oh, hi guys, she croaked. Then, with a little sigh, she passed out and fell into their arms. Madison never even heard Allie shout her name, and Jason caught her as she fell and scooped her up to carry her inside. Allie closed the door behind them, and Jason carried her into the living room. He could feel the heat of her fever through his clothes. She's burning up, he said, laying her on the couch. Allie went to get some cold water and a washcloth from the bathroom, while Jason gently tried to rouse Madison. She opened her eyes and looked at him blearily, and then toward the window. He could almost hear the reporters below, who had been stirred up by his and Allie's arrival, but Madison just stared and said nothing. Allie had come back with a wet cloth and a bowl and a bottle of pills. Put this on her forehead. I'll get a glass of water for these. On her way to the kitchen, she passed the dinner table. It was still laid out for dinner, the food and wine untouched. With a sad little sigh, she filled a glass with water and ran back to the living room, where Madison was awake but groggy. Make her take a couple of those, she told Jason, pointing at the bottle of pills. I'm going to see if they have any soup or something. Worried, they sat with her until she had taken some medicine and eaten the can of soup Allie had heated up for her. They tried to get her to talk, but she wouldn't say anything, other than to tell them that she didn't need an ambulance. Allie called Ian, who answered before the second ring. It's Madison, she blurted. She's got a fever, but she doesn't want us to call anyone. She's also not talking, and it's starting to freak us out. We gave her some antiparactics and some food, but since you're a doctor as well as her husband... I thought you might know what else we should do. She's conscious, though, he asked, his voice tight. Put me on speaker, please. Madison, are you... He was interrupted by a woman's voice. Ian, who are you talking to? Your grandmother let us in. Allie and Jason stiffened in surprise, but Madison just closed her eyes. Allie's eyes darted from her phone to Madison and back again. Um, she said... If the fever rises above 104, get her to the hospital, Ian went on. Allie couldn't tell whether the sharpness in his voice was a sign of his concern for Madison or for his impatience with the woman who had interrupted him. Madison reached out for the phone, but before Allie could hand it to her, Ian continued. I have to deal with... Wait for me, I'll call later. He hung up. Madison found herself smiling. I promised I'd trust him. So I should trust him. He had to go to Diana, and maybe it's been too chaotic for him to call. And the fact that he's with another woman right now doesn't mean... She shook off the thought. Allie, she said, her throat tight, I need you to take me to Mercy. She was so tired. Every word sounded like it had taken tremendous effort to say aloud. But what about the reporters out... Allie began, but she stopped herself. Jason, go get the car and pull around back. We won't be able to sneak past them, but we should get through the horde before it tears us apart. Her instincts had been correct. There were fewer reporters out back where Jason pulled up. Madison could barely walk, so Allie had to half carry her to the car. They only made it a few steps before the press started shouting questions. Mrs. Weston, do you have any comment on the video? yelled one. Where are the Westons right now? Why aren't you with them? Called another. Dr. Weston and Miss Thompson have been spotted shopping together. Do you have a comment? Shouted a third. Is there any truth to the rumors that the Westons and the Thompsons are set to announce an engagement? Someone asked. Madison's head spun while Allie tried to get her to the car. Miss Thompson? Do they mean Claire? And what engagement? Madison's thoughts were a jumble. 
and she was disoriented by the flashing lights from the cameras. It was all she could do not to pass out again. One of the reporters, scrambling to get a quote, slipped in front of her. Flailing as he fell, he grabbed hold of Madison's arms and pulled her down with him. There was an immediate rush of people surrounding her with more shouts than photographs. She was dimly aware of Allie shouting her name, but Jason had left the car and shouldered to the scum to shove the reporters away. None of them tried to help her. They just pushed closer and mobbed more questions at her. Can you confirm that the divorce proceedings have begun? Did you try to hide your past from the family before marrying Dr. Weston? Or are you going to step aside so he can marry Miss Thompson? Enough, shouted Allie. She and Jason got Madison off the sidewalk, but she fainted again. Seeing her best friend so helpless triggered a rage in Allie that surprised even her. Get away from her. Can't you see she needs medical attention? Don't you people have a conscience? If anything happens to her today, believe me, the Weston family will be the least of your problems. Go away. Her ferocity forced the press back a couple of paces, and Jason held Madison in his arms. Allie's heart broke for her friend. They had known each other since the seventh grade and become best friends almost instantly. Allie had been there for her when Zach left town, and she knew better than anyone what Madison had endured in the Greenwald house. All the gossip and cruelty that Madison had weathered had never broken her, but these last few months with Ian had been even harder on her. Sometimes it's almost like she's forgotten how to laugh. She's only 23, and she's already been through so much, Allie thought sadly. The rage she felt wasn't just for the press, though. None of this would be happening if Ian had stayed with her. But he left when she needs him the most, she fumed. They finally fought through the crowd and made it to the car. Allie's narrowed eyes let the press know that trying to block the car for more questions and photographs would be hazardous to their health. So they wisely stepped clear when Jason started the engine. There were more reporters at Mercy Hospital, but they were far less bold than they had been at the apartment. They stayed far from the entrance and took pictures without shouting questions. When Jason carried Madison in, Mateo happened to be looking over some charts at the nurse's station. With a frown, he called over an orderly with a wheelchair and had taken her to a treatment room. She had been drifting in and out of consciousness during the drive to the hospital, and she realized that no one was yelling questions at her anymore. Grateful for a little peace and quiet, Madison closed her eyes. She woke up at dawn the next day, hooked up to an IV. She felt awful, but the aches and pains of her fever were gone. Jason and Allie were both fast asleep in the chairs by her bed. Standing opposite them, Mateo was flipping through her charts when he noticed that she was awake. Good, he whispered. You're back. How do you feel? Madison started to cry. It had been precisely the wrong question to ask. Mateo sighed and wondered how many times she had been in the hospital since her marriage began. He tried to avoid drama and gossip. But even he knew she had been through a lot over the last few months. Getting control of herself, she shook her head and mumbled that she was feeling better. Mateo took another look at her chart and jotted down her temperature and the time before telling her he would be back later to look in on her. As he left, Madison felt a warm hand in hers and saw that Allie and Jason were awake. Allie sent Jason to get something to eat and waited until they were alone to squeeze Madison's hand. She looked like she was struggling with a decision she didn't want to make. Finally, she looked into Madison's eyes. Can we talk about you getting a divorce now? Madison's eyes filled with tears again, and Allie wiped them away. Look at yourself, Mad. Look at what you're putting yourself through. I know it was the right move to avoid having to marry Drake, but you've gone from one mess to another. If you married some normal guy, none of this would be happening. But a Weston, who can handle that kind of pressure? That's why the press is all over you. They don't want you, they want him and his family. People want to see the Westons brought down a peg. And they'll go through you to make that happen. You're a weapon being wielded against Ian and his family. Allie expressed. Madison shook her head. 
This didn't start with Ian, though. Even if I had never met him, all of this would still be happening. People might want to bring the weapons down, but they were always content to tear at me before we got married. And I was a great source of material for them. We both know that none of this is his fault or his family's. It's all my fault, she thought. Allie just sighed. I still wish he had turned out to be an ordinary doctor, she said. Ian Weston and his family had been nothing but trouble for Madison, who had always had more trouble than she deserved. Madison smiled at her and looked around for her phone. Ian had said he would call and she hoped she hadn't missed it. Allie watched her and kept her mouth shut. She still thought Madison would be better off divorcing him, but if she didn't want to, Allie wouldn't push it. Not until you're out of bed anyway, she thought with pursed lips. No one could deny that Madison was in love, or that the person she was in love with was Ian. Whether he was in love with her was not quite as clear. She had been in the hospital for a full day, and Allie and Jason had been looking after her. It was late afternoon when Ian finally called. Are you okay? Do you still have a fever? He sounded tired and tense, as if he were trying to force calm into his voice. She smiled. I'm much better, yes. What about Diana? Is she all right? Paul hadn't come out and said so, but he had heavily implied that all the media attention Madison was getting had led to Diana's collapse. Please be okay, old woman. Ian will never forgive me if something happens to you because of me, she prayed. My grandmother will probably outlive us all. She'll be fine. She took a little weak. He paused for a moment. I'll be back soon. Please wait for me. The sound of his voice cleared away the clouds that had been gathering over her. She told him she would, and they chatted for a few more minutes before saying goodbye. The bright smile on her face had barely dimmed when Allie rushed into the room breathless. She didn't say a word to Madison, but looked around the room frantically until she found the remote control for the television and switched it to one of the news channels. There was a story running about a radical drop in the stock prices of the Morris Corporation and Silverwood. Since that afternoon, both companies had been in freefall as shareholders began selling their Morris stock in unprecedented numbers. Zach, who was running Silverwood, had gone some of the flow, but the move was costing both companies insane amounts of money. There were even drops in the stock price of companies owned by the Thompsons, but it didn't look as drastic. The story cut to a clip of Ian from the press conference two days before. I look forward to seeing what happens next, he had said. He was behind this, and he was making sure people knew it. He knew the best way to send a message was to interfere with cash flow. And in less than a day, he had cost the Morrises millions of dollars. Ian's face was replaced on the screen by a shot of Luke, sweating and pale trying to reassure his remaining stockholders that there was no reason to panic. Madison wondered how long it would be before someone realized that this was the work of the mysterious phantom, who was almost certainly buying up the shares that were being sold off for pennies on the dollar. If he keeps this pace up, he'll end up owning more Morris stock than any of the Morrises, she thought. This is Ian, Allie said with certainty. He's doing this somehow. Madison just grinned. The story cut to Paul, who said, The Westons have no official comment at this time, but Ian Weston has made it very clear that Slander and his wife would have very serious consequences. Of course, Dr. Weston is a medical professional, not a businessman. But it's always helpful to remember that a scalpel's just like any other blade. Try not to annoy someone who knows how to use one. Madison bid back a laugh. While well, he had managed to avoid the limelight for most of his life, most people only knew Ian as an excellent, if occasionally gruff, surgeon with gifted hands. Now he was using those hands to hurt the people who had been hurting her. Even from miles away, he was looking out for her. The news story continued with some more background on Ian, of which there was little on public record. Her name was mentioned a few more times, along with some stills and video as was the Thompson family. The channel went to a commercial, and she looked out the window. 
The last time I looked out a window, it was over a sea of reporters and with a breaking heart, she thought. She had felt so lost that night. Everything had felt like it was falling apart, and she had no clue where she stood in her marriage or what would happen next. But Ian had sent a very clear message, and she realized that she didn't have anything to be afraid of. She wasn't used to having a companion, much less one like him. The next morning, Madison was released from the hospital. She had decided to follow Ian's lead and take the fight to her enemies. The first thing she did when she had a free moment was to call Zach. He was looking after her interests in secret, but now that he was dealing with the Silverwood crisis, he was probably buried in meetings. She left him a voicemail letting him know to be ready for a press conference. Madison booked one of the large press conference rooms at the Pink Star for that afternoon and cajoled Allie into writing and sending out a press release. By noon, the room was packed with reporters from local and national outlets waiting for her to make a statement. At two o'clock, she walked onto a dais with a table set on it. On the table was a cluster of microphones, and behind it hung an enormous screen showing the Pink Star Hotel's logo. She wore a simple white cotton dress, and was briefly blinded by the flashing of several dozen cameras. She sat calmly at the table and counted to 100, driving the journalist into a frenzy. Good afternoon, and thank you for coming, she said. My name is Madison Weston. The reporters began shouting questions at her in a flood of noise. Can you confirm that you were assaulted? What was the extent of the assault? Is there any truth to the allegation that you faked the assault to win sympathy from the Weston family? Why did your sister end up marrying your former boyfriend? And why did she release the video of your childhood assault? Does it have anything to do with reports that you and she have never gotten along? How do you respond to the allegation that you pushed your sister down the stairs at the Palace Arcade, resulting in her miscarriage? Did you push her on purpose? No matter how much she had tried to prepare, the onslaught took her by surprise. The rapid pace of the questions was exhausting, but she was shocked at the callousness with which they were asked. Backstage, Zack watched his sister's face go pale and clenched his fist. The press was relentless. The questions kept coming at her with increasing intensity. How do you know, Ian Weston? Why is your marriage so sudden? Have the Westons cut you off? Is there a divorce in the work? Were you the other woman in Dr. Weston's relationship with Claire Thompson? Are you planning to divorce Dr. Weston? She fought to recover her composure and put on a smile. Though she hadn't meant to, she had managed to wait them out. The speed of their questions slowed once they realized that she had to actually answer one or two of them. In the relative quiet, Madison addressed the cameras directly. There's a lot to cover but I'll do my best. I've just been released from the hospital, so bear with me. First, I want to clear the air about my assault. I don't have much to say about the assault itself, but yes, I was the child in that video. As to the extent of the assault, I believe you're aware of the examination I underwent fairly recently and its results, which was made public. That should answer your question. The doctors confirmed that I was still a virgin when the examination took place, and I think you will agree that their reputation rests on their truthfulness. This had nothing to do with the Weston family or my place in it. When the video captured those images, I probably wasn't even aware of the Weston's existence. It wasn't part of some plot to influence them or to gain sympathy from the public. The assault also had no bearing on what people have been saying about me for years. I was joining the Weston family, and I needed to put an end to the unfounded gossip that had ruined my reputation. That's why I underwent the examination. The stories that have been going around about me for years played a role in damaging my credibility. That's why I was the one who wanted to address publicly what should have never been a public matter, my virginity. Since those rumors about my sexual activity were weaponized to cast doubt on my motivations for marrying Ian, they needed to be debunked once and for all. It's the 21st century, and what I do with my body is my own business. But I knew it was never going to go away unless I faced it head on. I submitted to the examination 
and had the results verified by a team of doctors who are here today. At her nod, three people in the front row stood in turn to face the press. A wireless mic was hastily handed to them, and they introduced themselves and presented their credentials along with a brief statement. We're here to confirm that Mrs. Weston was indeed a virgin, in so far as medical science can determine, said one of the doctors, her distaste for the subject at hand clear. There is no indication that she had ever been sexually active before the examination undertaken at her request. Her duty done, she handed the microphone back to the tech and sat down. There was a rustle from the reporters as they recorded or wrote down the doctor's words. Madison let herself take a deep breath. The first hurdle had been dealt with. She knew that most people likely didn't care whether or not she was really a virgin, but she could no longer afford to ignore the gossip. You can't wish it away by pretending it doesn't exist, but you can neutralize it, dragging it into the light. And besides, no one bullies a Weston, she mused. For too long, Madison had let her enemies control the narrative, but she had found a way to cut the legs from underneath the lies. She imagined that Diana would approve. Now, all she had to do was settle the question of Kelsey. Once the room had quieted down a little, he leaned into the microphones again. Madison nodded her thanks to the doctor who had vouched for her and continued her statement. Now, going back to that video you've all seen. All I want to say about it is that the footage was obviously recorded in my family's home, and I was just ten years old. I couldn't say why exactly my sister released it. My relationship with my sister has always been a little contentious, but it's still a family matter, and it isn't anyone else's business. But neither was my virginity, so here we are. Yes, her husband and I were a couple once, but we both moved on. I don't hold any ill will against my sister for marrying him. And as far as being jealous of her, well, she couldn't suppress a wide grin. Have you seen my husband? Believe me, I'm not pining for Luke Morris. A ripple of laughter rolled through the room. Most of the women present, and more than a few of the men, recognized that a choice between a devastatingly handsome doctor with the Weston name and Luke Morris was hardly a choice at all. Only an idiot would choose the latter over the former if given the chance. Kelsey says the video was released by mistake, but the timing of the mistake was interesting. I know she claims that I pushed her down the stairs at the Palace Arcade and caused her to miscarry, but that is also completely false. There were dozens of witnesses, and there are even videos of the fall. We don't have to rely on hearsay and rumor when we have evidence. There were audible gasps as the Pink Star Hotel logo on the screen behind her dissolved to show a still image of the mall's escalator. She suppressed a smile, grateful that Paul had gone to the trouble of collecting the security camera footage of the incident and also of tracking down some witnesses who happened to have recorded video on their phones. The screen showed Kelsey and Madison from various angles had been synced to one another. In one corner was time-stamped security footage, and in the other, there were different cell phone camera reels. It showed their argument and the fall itself. There was audio from the cell phone footage so everyone could hear Kelsey's wild accusations that Madison was hiding her pregnancy from the Westons before she clearly threw herself down the stairs, pulling Madison with her. The journalist watched in awed silence while the footage played again, this time slowing down and freezing on Kelsey's hands holding tightly to Madison's arm. Madison's eyes were closed. She hated having to relive this moment, but she was surprised by the sudden uproar that erupted from the floor. The reporters came to their feet, shouting more questions at her. There's blood in the water, and they're about to start a frenzy, she thought. They had seen incontrovertible proof that Kelsey Greenwald Morris, the darling of the upper middle class, was nothing but a snake. Mrs. Weston, does this mean you're prepared to cut all ties with your sister? shouted a reporter from the back of the room. Have you considered the damage to her reputation? asked another, surprising her. Are you considering legal action? Are the Westons? What do they say about all of this? Are there money and power as shields for you? 
Madison shook her head and waited for the din to die down. These are questions you should be asking my sister, she said, along with the ones you should have been asking from the beginning. Sure if she's ever considered the damage she's done to my reputation. Ask her if she's aware of the damage she's done to my marriage and my family. Ask her what she was really thinking when she released the video of one of the most horrific moments of my life. Ask her if she ever thought about what she was doing to my mental health. You could have asked her any of those questions, but you never did. You just let her blind you with her tears and felt bad for her. But I never got the same consideration. She paused to let her words sink in. Whether Kelsey made a mistake or not, I have been traumatized by her actions. I'm done letting people hurt me, even my sister. This situation has caused me immense stress and pain, and it has interfered with my marriage and my family in ways you can't imagine. Let me ask you a question. If someone you love got sick or got hurt, you'd drop everything to be there for them, wouldn't you? There was a muted chorus of agreement and nodded heads, so she went on. When all of this happened, I fell apart. I was shattered, and friends and family were looking after me. That same night, my husband's grandmother had to be rushed out of state for treatment, and I couldn't go with him to be there for her. He made me stay here because he knew how fragile I was, and because he cares about me. And you tried to twist that into some story about him wanting to leave me. She paused again. For the first time that day, she was about to stretch the truth a little. For the greater good, though. Diana would probably approve. Ian definitely will, she told herself. The Westons love me. My husband loved me. They had to leave, but that doesn't mean I'm alone, she said, her eyes seeking out Francis and Paul at the edge of the daze. They nodded solemnly, silently confirming what she had just said. The press didn't miss it either. The men were known to be Ian's right and left hands, so they were proof that Madison could speak for them. As for all the speculation about Miss Thompson, she went on, remembering the sound of a woman's voice on her call with Ian, I can only say one thing. I don't even know her. There was an edge to her voice that hadn't been there before. All the chatter about a secret engagement plan couldn't matter less to her. She was Ian's wife. No matter who this other woman no one had ever met might be, she would have to stand aside. Allie stood at the back of the room, watching Madison play the crowd. She remembered being told to stay away from her even at college. There was never a shortage of people who wanted to convince Allie that Madison was just a party girl with no morals. She had never believed them, and even though Madison played it off, Allie knew it had hurt her deeply. You're a whole different woman these days, she thought. Marrying Ian had changed her friend. No, not changed. Revealed. This is who you've always been. Allie was practically floating with pride. Everything Madison had been through starting with the way Stella cut her out of her own family, had made her the bold, strong woman who now had the press eating out of the palm of her hand. She had spent years hiding the pain she had carried with her, and it shaped her like fire shapes iron. Nothing was being hidden anymore. Ellie wiped away a tear and she thought, There has never been anything weak about you. Mrs. Weston, do you have any comment on the recent upset in the stock market? asked one of the reporters. There's been some speculation that it's somehow tied to you. She shrugged. I don't pretend to know anything about the stock market, but I think incompetent men have always looked for excuses for their incompetence, and if it involves a woman, they'll always get away with it. If I had that kind of power, I wouldn't bother having this press conference. Whatever else I may be, I'm pretty sure I'm not the face that sank a thousand companies this week. Or, you know, just the one. The audience chuckled and Madison stood. That's all. Thank you for coming and letting me set the story straight, she said, and left the days to a chorus of ignored questions. The press conference had been a triumph. Madison had been calm and in control of the story from the moment she had sat down, and she had hit the perfect balance between poised and cold. She spoke passionately about her suffering without asking for pity and lovingly of her husband and his family without seeming servile. There would be no question now that she was a Weston, through and through. Miles away, 
Diana chatted happily with Daniel and Cassandra, while Ian sat in the corner looking at his phone. She had never looked less ill. If he hadn't known that she had been backed into a corner, Ian would have rushed home the same day he had arrived. Now and then, Daniel caught Ian grinning faintly at his phone. No one knew what he was watching, though. He was in his little world with a small screen and tiny earphones bathed in autumn sunshine. I don't even know her, Madison was saying on his direct feed from the pink star, making him laugh out loud. He bit back the laugh when L. Thompson walked into the room. Ellie, Diana cooed, I'm so touched you came all the way out here just for me. Ellie looked down and smiled shyly. She cast a glance at Ian and felt her heart start to pound. He met her eyes and nodded a greeting while getting to his feet. I have some calls to make, he said, leaning down to kiss his grandmother's cheek. I'll be back to check on you later. Daniel hastily got to his feet to follow him, leaving his grandmother with Ellie and Cassandra. I could go too. He hurried down the hall to catch up to Ian. So, baby brother, what's the news back home? He asked softly, gesturing at the phone. Ian couldn't wipe the grin from his face. Madison's performance at her press conference had been remarkable. Ian didn't even bother to answer Daniel, who learned everything he needed to know from his brother's smile. I'm heading back tomorrow, Daniel said. Keep your head up. You should start thinking about how to set things right between Grandma and Madison. Ian's smile faded. His grandmother's stubbornness was a challenge. Daniel clapped him on the shoulder. Chin up. Her 80th birthday's coming up. You know what she's like on her birthday. Like the sun breaking through clouds, Ian's spirits rose again. Her birthday, he murmured. That could be Madison's big chance. That evening, Ian strolled through town on an errand for Diana for some stationery she adored. Normally, she traveled with a small staff who would do that sort of thing for her, but she had left them at home, so her grandchildren were pressed into service, just as they had been when they were children. He smiled at the memory of wanting to please his grandmother and competing with Daniel and Cassandra for her favor. He was so nostalgic that he almost walked past Elle without noticing her. He noticed the three tough-looking men that surrounded her first. You broke our sign, lady, one of them was saying, holding up a shard of broken plastic. You need to pay for it. You tourists are all the same. You think your money means you can do whatever you want. Elle fumbled with her purse and pulled out a hundred dollar bill. I'm so sorry. I didn't do it on purpose. I'll pay for the damages, of course. The man with the broken sign eyed the designer label on the bag and the stack of bills inside it. It's not just about the damage, it's the principle of the thing, he said. We'll lose business if people don't see our sign. He gestured to the dim little shop behind him. This is how we feed our families. That sign was custom, and it could take weeks to replace it. We need at least a grand. Elle blinked at him in surprise. I don't... What's going on, Elle? Ian asked, stepping in closer. She looked relieved to see him but her eyes were bright with fear. The three men surrounding her looked him up and down, deciding whether he was a mark or a problem. Mind your own business, hotshot, said one of them. This doesn't concern you. Unless you have a thousand bucks for the sign, growled a third. Ian frowned and took a long look at the sign, the men, and their shop. A thousand dollars, he murmured. Little shakedowns like this were fairly common in a town that attracted wealthy people, looking for a little quiet. Most of them would just pay to avoid the hassle. I wouldn't be surprised to find out they have a couple more broken signs to harass careless people with, he thought. The leader of the little group sneered. Fifteen hundred now. Interest. He winked at his friends who snickered. We'd hate to have to call the cops. I see. Ian said and reached into his jacket pocket. He pulled out his phone instead of his wallet, though. He tapped at the screen and held the phone up to his ear. Officer, 
I'm at the corner of 8th and Cooper in Old Town, and some men here would like you to come down immediately. Hmm? No, it's not an emergency. He looked at the men. Not yet, anyway. Realizing what was going on, the leader of the group tried to snatch the phone from Ian's hand, but he dodged the lunge and put his phone away. Stepping close to Elle, he whispered in her ear, Stand back. Don't look. Be ready to run if this goes bad. She nodded and reluctantly backed away, forcing herself to stay calm. I hope they send an ambulance for you, pretty boy, sat the ringleader. Calling the cops over a little cash you wouldn't even miss wasn't a good idea. Ian grinned at him. It's the principle of the thing. With a shout, the man threw a wild punch, which Ian dodged with surprising grace. He gracefully avoided two more blows before the other guys, realizing that they might have an actual fight on their hands, rushed to back up their buddy. They surrounded Ian, who moved in a slow circle so that his opponents were facing away from Elle. By doing so, he had also put a wall to his back, making sure no one could sneak up behind him. He took a deep breath and lifted his fist in a boxing stance. Grandma's going to kill me when I get back without her stationery, he thought. Elle huddled against the wall a few feet away with her eyes closed. She tried to swallow her panic and ignore the sounds of muffled curses and fists against flesh. When a hand touched her shoulder, she let out a tiny yelp. Let's go, Ian muttered. He gently pushed her forward. Don't look back. Just keep walking. She nodded and let herself be led away, pretending she didn't hear the men who had threatened her groaning on the ground. Her breath came in shuddering gasps, and she struggled to calm down. Ian paid close attention to her complexion and her breath rate, cursing himself for forgetting that she had a severe heart condition. And I told her to run if things went bad. Some doctor you are, he thought. Elle needed a new heart but she wouldn't be considered a high priority for a transplant until or unless her condition worsened and became life-threatening. A wave of dizziness almost made her stumble, but she stayed upright and clenched her jaw against the self-loathing that threatened to overtake her every time her body betrayed her. She knew it was foolish. A heart defect wasn't her fault. But she couldn't always reconcile what she knew to be true with what she felt. When she staggered again, he pulled her close. Can I carry you? he asked. Miserably, she nodded, closing her eyes so she wouldn't have to see the pity she knew she would see in his. He lifted her like she weighed nothing. Like a porcelain doll, she thought bitterly. The thrill of being held in a pair of strong arms was tempered by the shame she had been working with the therapist to let go of. When she was certain she wasn't going to cry, she opened her eyes and looked up at him. His handsome face was set in concentration as they kept an eye out for obstacles in their path in the fading light. Under different circumstances, this would be the most romantic thing that's ever happened to me, she thought. She reached up and brushed his cheek on impulse. Ian looked down at her quizzically. I lost, she whispered. I lost it, though. No wish for you. She felt the small chuckle through his warm chest more than she could hear it. She was dizzy again, but there was no flood of shame this time. Her hotel wasn't far, so she knew this moment would end soon. She rested her head on his chest and let her mind wander. I'm back, Ian, and I won't run away this time. Do you even remember me? And Madison, you don't know me at all, she thought. Madison tried to look as inconspicuous as possible in the VIP lounge of the small terminal that catered to a private aircraft. Seated between Paul and Francis, she toyed with her phone to avoid making eye contact with anyone, especially the small handful of reporters gathered in a designated press area. There weren't many people in the lounge, but she did catch them looking at her speculatively from time to time. A headline caught her eye, and she read the story with raised eyebrows. Just as she was about to show it to Paul, a chime over the speaker drew everyone's attention to the doors leading in from the carmack. The first people to walk in greeted Paul and Francis genially and nodded politely at her. One of them looked at her, puzzled, and then at the newspaper in his hands before looking back at her. She realized that she was getting more than a few curious looks as people declaimed. 
Paul glanced at her with a question in his eyes. But before he could say anything, the Westons entered the lounge. Cassandra and Daniel were in front, chatting amiably, but Madison only had eyes for Ian, walking with Diana and frowning deep in thought. Cassandra called her name and looked back at her startled little brother. Ian left his grandmother's side and hurried to Madison, his eyes shining. I didn't expect to see you here, he said. She smiled at him and briefly forgot how to speak. They hadn't been apart for very long, but he had called her every day. Sometimes they'd only spoken for a few minutes, but once or twice he had stayed on the phone until one or both of them had fallen asleep. The brief separation had ironically made them feel like they were falling in love. They stood face to face, grinning at each other for a moment, but for them it felt like hours. Ian broke the spell by leaning forward and kissing her forehead. Hi, he said. Hi, she said. Cassandra made a playful retchy noise behind them and laughed. Thank you for listening. Please don't forget subscribe. See you on the next episodes.